Right, ready, Chair. Okay. Welcome, everybody. This is Dobstel's Planning Committee on the 9th of March 2021, uh, conducted by uh, Zoom. Um, right. Um, move on to apologies and substitutes, please, Jason. Uh, sorry, Chair, it'll, it'll be me this evening, um, Simon. Um, there are no um, ex there are no extra um, apologies. Just the existing no staff apology, apology from just the existing staff apology from Councillor O'Brien. Yep. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, so now item number two: approval of minutes of the previous meeting. Go on, somebody to move those. I so move. Second, it, Chair. Second, Chair. Yeah, second. Okay, thank, you. thank you very much. All those in favour, please show. Okay, thank you very much. Item number three, interests. I've had none declared. Uh, is there anything from the floor? No, I'll tell you that as read then. Um, so now we move on to applications for determination. You'll find an updated list uh, of representation. I just want to make it known this is version two and the comments about Hilltop uh, from the council is actually Council Sue Burkle and not Sue Ball. So just, just to make clarification on that for you. So anyway, um, moving on swiftly, uh, we'll uh, move to chair. item 5.1, which is application number two. Chair, yeah, yeah, um, we're getting the, the echoes are really bad. Is there anything we can do? Yes, yeah. Chair, I was about to say this you're echoing, Jason, and there's like a background noise. Hello, no, not too good. Hello, I can hear you, Jason, but you sound garbled. Hello. Chair, can I suggest you sign out and sign back in? Because I think you're having technical problems. Hello. Hello. Jason, Hello? can you hear me? Can you hear? No, Simon. Can't, can't hear anybody. Uh, can we phone Councillor Atkin? He's obviously got technical problems at his end. Hello. Hello. I'll try, get, I'll try and get a message to him. Hello. Hello. Simon. You're on mute. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm just trying to ask, um, trying to find a telephone number at the moment, if you just bear with me. Uh, it, might, it might have to be that the Vice Chair, Councillor Morley, takes over until we get connection back with Councillor Atkin. Yeah, I... I uh, Can you hear me, Jason? Yes. Just, only just. I suggest you switch off and switch back on, Jason. Yep. Yeah. So works. yeah, I'll, I'll I'll do that. Technology is fine when it's working, yeah.
Can everybody hear me now? Yes, Chair. Yeah, I can hear from Tony. I think uh, I, I think there's a few internet problems in Darlington. It's been playing up all day, so thanks for your forbearance. Um, so, do you want me to just go back to what we've done? So, we've done uh, we've done the apologies, we've done the approval of the minutes, we've done the interests, and now we're moving on to applications for determination. And as I said in the late representation, you'll you'll note on the last item, Hilltop, that the questions uh, pertain to Councillor Burfoot and not Councillor Subal. So, just just to make you aware of that. So, we'll we'll move on item five point one. Can I take a roll call? Do we need to do a roll yeah, call? Yeah. Yeah. Simon, would you like to do the roll call? I'm just about to do. Uh, right, OK. Councillor Archer. Here. Atkin. Here. Ball. Here. Burfoot. Here. Bottle. Here. Donnelly. Here. Elliot. Here. <clears throat> It's Herbert. Councillor Fitzherbert. I can see you. Oh, there we are. Uh, Councillor Lees. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Morley. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Purdy. Yeah. Councillor O'Brien. Yes, here. Yeah. And Councillor Slack. Here. Yeah. Right. I think that's everyone, Chair. I'm not sure if Councillor Fitzherbert's... Ah, yes, he's with us. That's OK. All here, Chair. Right. Thank you very much. So we'll move on to the main body. So it's item number 5.1. This is application number 20 stroke 00884. Uh, it's a direction of number one, a dwelling house with detached garage and associated uh, relocation of access of land at the rear for Melvin Close, Fulham Ward, Derbyshire. I believe there is one speaker on this, and it's Julia Allen, agent, to speak in favour of the application. You have five minutes, and I'll indicate when you have 30 seconds left. So please, Julia, over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Hello, my name is Julia Allen. I'm the agent acting on behalf and representing the applicant, Mr Barry Thraves, this evening. The applicant grew up in the village of Holland Ward and his father has owned uh, number four Melville Close for 48 years and the land rear of Melville for, for Melville Close since the early 1980s. A large timber storage shed has been sited on the land since that time and has been used to keep chickens and a large vegetable plot and store a camper van. As the applicant's father has since retired, the site is now within the ownership of his son, the applicant, Barry Thraves. I'm a local planning agent and I operate as Julia Allen Building Design based in Snellston. Uh, we specialise in the Derbyshire Dales area. So the applicant contacted us uh, for planning advice back in November 2019 and we submitted for formal pre-application guidance in December 2019. Formal pre-application guidance was supplied on the 28th of January 2020 and we were advised that the site is considered as acceptable for development in principle under policy S3 of the adopted Derbyshire Dales local plan 2017. We have undertaken lengthy and detailed consultation with the planning case officer, Andrew Stark, on the design of this new dwelling, and we submitted for further formal pre-application design guidance in June 2020 to ensure we are presenting a design fitting for the context and setting of this site. We have met all the design criteria laid out within the formal pre-application guidance supplied in terms of scale and height, window balance and design detailing. The proposed new dwelling has a wealth of traditional dis brickwork design features, including a plinth course, brick arches to all the windows on all elevations, the gable and eaves detailing. 
Reclaimed building materials are proposed where available, such as reclaimed traditional ridge tiles and reclaimed oak posts for the canopy porch. All will be sourced locally from Coordon in Rugeley. They are champions for the supply and reuse of sustainable building materials. Specialist energy consultants, EPS Group, have been consulted throughout the design process to achieve exceptionally high thermal fabric efficiency to ensure the new dwelling has minimal heat losses. Heating and hot water to the property will be delivered via a modern air source heat pump and the design goes above and beyond the requirements of policy PD7 to ensure the property contributes to achieving national targets and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We have worked closely with the planning case officers to ensure the site layout, proposed detached garage and relocation of the existing access have all been carefully considered. An existing mature ash tree is located just outside the site to the northern point and the existing access to the site currently beneath the large canopy. For the long term health of this significant tree, resiting access will be of overall benefit. It is proposed that the existing access is recited approximately five metres away from the existing access and away from beneath the tree canopy. A traffic survey has been undertaken to ensure that there are no adverse traffic impacts of this proposal and data was submitted to Derbyshire County Highways. There are no objections from County Highways following the receipt of this data and the proposed access complies with all highway safety requirements. A public right-of-way order has been submitted to Derbyshire County Council for the formal diversion of footpath number 12 along the western edge of the site. Footpath number 12 is currently walked in a diagonal line across the adjacent field to the west of the site and has never been formally diverted. This application will remedy this matter and make improvements to widen the existing access point. A protected species survey and report was conducted by Chase Ecology in May 2020 and no further survey work is recommended. A sustainability statement has been submitted with this application and includes for the sighting of a small bird nest boxes around the site, wildflower planting to the garden area and the installation of eco hedgehog fence plates along the site, the western boundary fence line to protect and support the local hedgehog populations. Once built, this property will be an attractive in appearance, championing good design, contributing to placemaking in the village of Cullent Ward and the wider Derbyshire Dales district. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the local authority case officers throughout the process of this application, and I would like to thank the committee for their time in considering this seconds left. tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, over to Chris. Thank you, Chair. At this point, I talk members through um, the presentation, um, which includes photographs of the site and also details of the, the application proposal. In order to do that, I need the committee clerk or the, the host of this meeting, meeting to enable participant screen sharing. So I'd be grateful if, um, if Simon or Jason could enable that, please. At the moment, that's been disabled, so I'm unable to share the presentation with, with members at this point. Um, before we um, we go through the presentation it's, and um, and participant screen sharing is allowed, it's probably a good opportunity just to go through some of the late representations that have been received. Um, these were circulated to members um, today, and you'll note um, there's two items in respect of this particular application. Um, members' attention is drawn to those matters, and as we work through the presentation, I can talk through some of the the issues that have been raised. The agent has succinctly set out the, um, the protracted discussions that have been had at the pre-application stage and, um, and has also um, talked through the design approach and also the, um, the, the stage we've reached in, in, in consideration of this application in terms of um, coming up with a scheme that is considered to respond positively to the local character and identity of this part of the settlement. Um, I'll go through um, the presentation now because the um, screen sharing has been been enabled. So bear with me two moments. So you should see on your screen um, details of this particular application. Now the application site area is as hatched pink on this um, particular 
on a survey plan. So you can see it's garden land um, to um, a property off, off Melville Close. It includes a timber clad outbuilding. Um, opposite, there's a, um, a detached two story red brick property. You'll see that from the photographs that I'm about to, to show you. Um, so the full extent of the site is, is outlined um, on this particular plan. And you'll note that the site, the application site borders a number of existing residential property properties and is immediately opposite um, a house on the opposite side of, of, um, of the road. Now, it's worth pointing out that this particular part of land does lie within um, the settlement framework boundary for Fulham Ward. So the previous speaker and the agent correctly um, stated that, that policy S3, which deals with development in settlement framework boundaries does apply in respect of this application. So here we've got um, the red edged application site area, which is outlined in red um, on the left hand ordnance survey drawing. Um, you can see obviously the road moss lane there and obviously the res existing residential properties off Melville Close. And to the right of that, you can see a proposed block, block plan which sets out the position of the proposed dwelling on site and also the detached garage. Um, there has been discussions about the siting of that property on this particular plot and also um, the position of the access. You'll note from the, um, the agent and the, the previous speaker that there is a, a mature ash tree um, along the site frontage that you'll see a photograph in a moment. Um, and the access was repositioned in order to safeguard that, that particular tree, which is an important component um, of Moss Lane, an important landscape feature that we, we wanted to see retained on the site. So here we've got a more detailed um, block plan, which shows the extent again of the, and the, 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 um, the position of the dwelling and associated garage on site, the extent of the hard standing and access point onto Moss Lane. And you can see the, um, the tree, the ash tree there, the larger of the trees plotted to the north of that, that access point. So in terms of the, uh, the design of the, um, the property, you can see it's fairly traditional in its design. It's a two story house with um, a second story within the, the roof space. Um, you can see there you've got um, a roof plan and you've got the various levels to the accommodation with the restricted headroom at, within that, that roof space and the second floor level. It's worth pointing out that there has been amendments made to the, um, the dwelling as part of considering, consideration of this application and the ridge height and eaves height of the building has been reduced. But you can see from this drawing that it's a, a building of traditional design to be constructed in brick with plain clay tiles. There has been some um, rationalization and some changes to, to windows to reflect that traditional and, um, and local character. That gives you a feel for the, the general design and, and scale of, of the proposed dwelling. You see the measurements on that plan. And then we've got an elevation and floor plan of the detached garage on site. So it's a double garage, um, a building that's a little over, well, 5.6 metres high to, to the ridge. Now, this plan is quite useful because it sets out um, the legal alignment of public footpath number 12, Holland Ward. And the agent has already mentioned that um, the, the legal alignment was shown to, um, to cross through the, the application site. Um, but in reality, on the ground, that has always been the, the, the route of the footpath has always been as set out um, on A to D on this particular drawing. And that has now been regularized and um, a diversion order has been granted to um, retain that footpath on its um, current um, alignment on, on site on the ground. So that gives you an idea as to where the legal alignment was. So that's the, um, the solid black line and where the, um, the diverted footpath um, order grants the new the new route of the footpath which is actually in its current position in terms of where it's what, what, how it's walked currently so now we're going to show you photographs of the site and this gives you an idea as to where those photographs are taken so photograph one is looking out towards um, the property on the opposite side of the road the two-story house and then the relationship of the the site to um, adjacent bungalows to the south and um, southeast so you can see here um, the access, the existing access to this bit of land and the um, the house opposite. Again, that's a, a red brick property, plain clay tiles and um, traditional detailing, quite a large extension to the back of, of that property. And it sits where it addresses the, the, the main road. 
and you've got a detached detached garage as well within the curtilage of that property so looking back this is looking towards the um the the bungalows on melville close and this is the extent of the the application site and the timber clad building that currently sits on that site this is the relationship of um, the application site with the, the bungalow immediately to the southeast. You can see there that there are windows that face in the direction of, of the application site. And you get a feel for where that property sits in relation to the boundary of the application site. And then finally, we've got a view looking out towards um, the countryside and towards the big in view development, um, just to show you a full sort of 360 perspective of the site and um, its environs. Happy to take questions at, at this stage what i'll do is i'll revert back to the um the elevations plan because i think that shows you um in great detail what's actually proposed on this site that might be a, a talking point for for members thank you very much chris the first on my list is councillor gary purdy Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I think it's important. Have you got the two correspondence and uh, letters to Anne, Chris? The uh, first one from Mr. R.A. Walter. I think it's R.A. Mr. I'm sorry if it's not. But it says from R.A. Walter and H.E. Short of Six Melville Close. And then the second correspondence is from Graham and Michelle Buckle of 31 Moss Lane. Uh, whilst you've circulated those tours, uh, I do think it's important that there's some response to those points raised because I think there's some clarity required uh, to help members of the public who are probably not as familiar with planning law as we are, what can and cannot be achieved. So I'd be grateful if you could just pick out some salient points, Chris, and answer those points. Thanks, Chair. Yes, and I think um, you're right. Thank you for um, bringing that to my attention, um, Councillor Purdy, because there are issues that are raised within um, those representations that I think we, we should air at committee and members should give give us consideration to some of those those points that are made. The representations from um, R.A. Walter and H.E. Short, um, some of those representations relate to um, what are perceived as inaccuracies within the officer's report. Now, the, the, um, the representations refer to the dwelling being a three-storey house, and we accept that there are three levels of accommodation. Obviously, it's a two-storey dwelling in terms of its scale, but there, are, there is accommodation in the roof. So we accept that there are three levels of accommodation. Um, references made to the closest dwelling, neighbouring dwelling to their bungalow being, um, sorry, the closest neighbouring dwelling being their bungalow at six Melville Close. And there's reference in the report, um, which is an error to nine Melville Close, but it is... Um, an error and we do recognise that it, it, the closest dwelling to the site is six Melville Close. In the previous paragraph it's clear that what is meant is six Melville Close, it is just a drafting error in the report. Um, we then move on to issues relating to surface water runoff and, and flooding. Now we have to reflect on um, the nature of this particular application, it's a, it is a minor application. The lead local flood authority wouldn't get involved in providing detailed comments on an application of this scale and nature. However, obviously flooding and surface water discharge is, is a consideration. However, when um, building a, a dwelling house on a development plot such as this, the applicant will need to demonstrate that surface water discharges um, in accordance with a, an approved hierarchy for surface water discharge. And the preference is for infiltration into the ground, and then it moves to a water course and um, then a, a combined or, 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 or sewer. Now, the applicant will have to make a suitable connection um, to deal with surface water. Um, otherwise, the property will not um, secure building regulations approval. It won't be allowed or it's, it's not permitted for the development or for the applicant, for the dwelling house to discharge or for surface water to discharge onto private land. It will need to be disposed of in an appropriate manner to prevent flooding and to deal with surface water from, from the development. So I hope that addresses the, um, the land drainage comments. Um, there are comments relating to the impact of the development on residential amenity. Now, I think I'm still sharing my screen. I think at the moment you can see the elevations plan on the screen. And I think it's probably better to show, can members see the, um, the, the block plan of this proposed dwelling? Yep. 
and it does pose a dilemma because it does sit close, obviously, to those existing bungalows on the site, but it does have a an interface and a connection with Moss Lane and the development opposite. And we feel that this development in terms of its scale does respond positively to Moss Lane and existing developments in that immediate locality. Um, there is recognition that it is a two-story house and there is recognition that it sits within close proximity to existing houses to the south and east. However, we feel that the distances involved and the scale of the property is such that it won't result in unacceptable overbearing or, or overshadowing effects. There won't be any significant loss of privacy based on position of windows and the distance involved such that we could, in officer's opinion, sustain a recommendation of refusal on amenity grounds. Hence why we're comfortable with, with the scale of, of this, this dwelling and its relationship to existing um, neighbouring properties. But happy to take questions and members might have, have a different view on that. Um, so that deals with the, the representations from R.A. Walter and H.E. Short. Some of those representations are repeated in the representations received from Graham and, and Michelle Buckle. There's reference in there to, um, to the scale of the dwelling and, and its appropriateness. Um, it's considered it doesn't comply with, with S3 and PD1. I think I've explained briefly why we feel that it does comply with development plan policies in, in officers' opinion. Um, climate change is referenced. Um, the agent has set out the measures that are incorporated into the design of, of this particular dwelling to help mitigate um, and adapt to, to, to climate change. Um, there is a, an air, horse, air source heat pump proposed um, and there are other measures that will help to, um, to address, address that policy requirement. Um, so I don't think there's anything else unless members have picked up in, in um, themselves other issues that have been raised that haven't been covered. And I'm happy to take further questions on that, but I hope that gives you a reasonable overview of the, the representations received. Thank you, Chris. Next on my list is Councillor Slack. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, Chris, uh, I think this... Uh, very impressive for each source pumps. Uh, it's good to see people getting away from gas boilers, etc. But uh, my question is on uh, looking at the photographs uh, of the, the outer building, it seems to be raised up on a bank from the photograph I've just seen. Uh, is that stopping it or is it going, Chris, the, the art building? So the, the outbuilding goes. So the outbuilding, I don't. Oh. Yeah. See my cursor on the screen it's broadly in sort of the bottom end of this site here that's right yeah um so that's yeah. that's going and uh, yeah. new buildings a new garage building is going here um close to the boundary is number 31 and then you've got the bulk and the mass of the dwelling beyond that in this location obviously on yeah the yeah yeah thank you Chris. thank you very much the next on my list is councillor burfoot uh thank you chair um Two questions I've thought of um, as we've gone on with the presentation. So um, can Chris tell us that the bungalows that are in the immediate vicinity of this application, are they relatively consistent in size and scale? Um, it looks as though they might be, but I'd just like confirmation on that. And then um, this, this application is... Um, it's described as a two-storey house, but with three floors. So it's got three floors of habitable rooms. Does that mean that the gradient of the roof would have to be very steep? Okay. Thank you. I'll take um, those questions in, in turn. So the first um, question related to the, um, the character of the bungalows in the immediate locality. Just looking at this photograph here, fronting Moss Lane, you've got a series of dormer bungalows and you can see the side elevation of um of number 31 just in the the background to this image on the previous image you've got a series of bungalows and these are consistent so if we go back to bear with me two minutes i'm hoping you can see there the image of or the ordnance survey plan of the site and then um, a diagram showing where the images have been taken. So immediately to the south, you've got those single story properties. You've got the dormer bungalows along Moss Lane, but then off Melville close to the south, you've got some unusual sort of two story houses and you have got a mix of properties all built around the sort of same era um, within this particular area. But then you've got 
the site is different in that you have got an interface or a um, a connection with Moss Lane, a direct connection, and the the development's opposite. So you've got the two-story house, red brick house, immediately opposite that we saw the photograph of at the beginning of um, the photographs, and then you've got that those bungalows and a mixture of sort of house types to the south. But I'd say the character of the of the area immediately to the south of the site is bungalows or dormer bungalows. But there is some variety to the design and general appearance. So moving on to the the second question. Um, Sorry, sorry, Councillor Burford, you're gonna to have to could, could you just repeat the second question for me just so I can just so I fully understood what you're asking. Yeah, of course I can. Um it, it, this application is um down as a two-story house, but with three floors. So there are three floors of habitable rooms. Because there are habitable rooms in the roof, does that mean that the the gradient of the roof is going to be um steeper than if you like a, a normal house? No, we've worked quite hard. And if you look the the, the second floor plan, um, you can see there the layout of the second floor. And you have got restricted headroom and voids within that within that space. And if you look at the proportions of the house, we've worked hard to try and um, think carefully about the scale of the building in its form. So it has um, a fairly traditional and modest gable width. I think if you see on this plan here, you've got 6.7 metre gable width. And you can see there you've got a fairly traditional roof form so we haven't we haven't got a an over wide gable and a very steep roof pitch to accommodate um significant significant accommodation at second floor level is relatively modest level of accommodation and it is restricted headroom at that that second floor level thank you thank you very much next on my list is councillor o'brien Thank you, Chair. Chris, um, is a question on the, the drainage, which you've covered partially, but uh, I note that a significant part of the site is proposed to be covered with hard standing, probably around a third. And uh, that, of course, isn't going to be covered by a building regulation approval. C can you tell me what proposals there are for the drainage of that um, hard standing? Is it intended to be permeable or semi-permeable? Is it going into the surface water system or is there simply no detail? Thank you, Captain Bob. Uh, my understanding is that as part of the building regulations process, um, the site will need to be demonstrated that site can be properly drained and there will need to be drainage for, um, for the hard standing and, and the dwelling house on the site. However, um, if infiltration is a possibility, um, then we could consider the permeability of the, the surface treatment and members could condition that if they felt that was necessary. Um, but I think it, if members if members wanted to, um, to take a belt and braces approach and make sure that drainage is covered both in terms of the planning permission that's granted and also the building regulation stage, they could ask for a scheme to be submitted and, and approved and we could consider that and um, as part of that, we can consider all the associated landscaping works and hard landscaping works to make sure that the, what we were satisfied there would, would be no adverse effects um, in terms of flooding from the site and, and, and third party land. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Fitzherbert. Thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to ask about the ownership because I did visit the site this afternoon, socially distanced. And, um, and and took some photographs and uh, saw that uh, because it's 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 rather unusual sort of quirky little site at the sort of north end of of Holland Village you know by this close and um, you know I walked along the road which is Moss Lane and and noted where the footpath was and and, and where it would subsequently go um a little bit further and then I, I was wondering where the new access would be well that would be further south from where the footpath is which i think is probably sensible to the to the actual site i just wondered if, if uh I, I don't know whether it's pertinent or whether you know the answer but uh whether you know the owners of number four owned that particular obviously i, I assume they own that site because it's their shed and there's, there's steps to the to their back door do they own the field as well 
Thank you, Councillor Fitzherbert. The um, the extent of land ownership is set out in the the application, and uh, my understanding is that the owners of number four Melville Close own this part of land and use it as extended garden. The agent sort of touched on land ownership and um, the transfer of that land to another member of the family um, to develop the site. Um, but I think in terms of land ownership, it just really, the, the extent of their land ownership, from my understanding, is just this the number four Melville Close and then this additional land, which is used as extended garden. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Next on my list is Councillor Buttle. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm wondering about solar panels. If you've got an air source heat pump, that's electric heating. Is there actually space to put a decent amount of solar panels on the roof of this and would they need planning permission to put that on later? That's a good question, um, Councillor Buttle. Just bear with me two minutes. I'll just go to the previous slide, Jean, to see. If you look at the orientation of the house on the site, there is opportunity. Obviously, there's quite a significant expanse of roof that faces in a southerly direction. We're not proposing to remove um, permitted development rights from this particular property. So you'll note from the, um, the recommended conditions that, yeah, it's not explicit. We are, there is a, from, in the conditions that have been drafted, there is a requirement or there is a restriction that removes any external alterations. It doesn't explicitly restrict um, the provisions that are afforded to microgeneration equipment. But I think we do actually need to think about the wording of that condition, condition three on the officer's reports. It does say no external alteration. So you could construe that as meaning any, you know, fixing of solar panels to the roof. Um, and the, the reason for the condition is in the interest of residential amenity. And I think alterations such as, such as that have a positive impact, don't they, rather than negative. They don't affect the residential amenity of, of adjacent dwellings. So I think, I think it's probably a little bit too onerous, the wording of that condition. And um, it could be worded in a way that offered more flexibility to allow retrospective installation of uh, microgeneration equipment. And there is certainly opportunity to install solar panels on this particular property. Thank you. Would it, would it apply to the garage as well? Because if you're going to have an electric charging point, it might be tempting to put solar panel, electric vehicle, you might be tempted to put solar panels on the roof of that. Yeah, as it stands, I mean, again, yeah, they could um, introduce solar panels to the garage roof. As it stands, though, in the wording of condition three, I think we'd have to say you'd, you'd construe that as meaning any alteration. So I think that would include anything fixed like solar panels to the roof of the building. So at the moment, that would be captured, in my view, by the condition, meaning that the applicant would need to apply for planning permission. But we could fine tune that to only focus on the development that's permitted that affects the residential immunity of, um, of the dwellings that sit close to this, this, this particular site. I think that would be sensible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Buttle. The last on my list for questions is Councillor Donnelly. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a clarification, Chris, um, with my question is regarding the size display onto Moss Lane. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Donnelly. Um, this is covered in the, um, the conditions. There is a requirement for the, um, the access to be laid out as approved. I'm just checking the, the conditions and draw your attention to that. Yeah, so condition nine of the, um, the recommendation. So the requirement is for 2.4 metre by 98 metre splay to the north of the site to be provided. And then a 205 metre splay to the south. Um, so that's quite a significant splay onto the highway, but it does allow for retention of, of the tree, from my understanding. So it retains landscape features, but it also provides a suitable access onto the highway. Thank you, I'm happy with that, yeah. Thank you very much, Councillor Lodick. Now we're going to move into debate. Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm happy with the officer's report and uh, I commend the applicant and the agent for doing as much as they can with regard to green energy. Um, I understand the objections from neighbours and I think it's very difficult sometimes for neighbours to understand planning law. And I'll, I'll try and explain it as briefly and simply as I can. 
In planning law, the first raison d'etre is that you have to approve a planning application. That's government edict. You have to approve unless there are material considerations for refusal. Um, we find no material considerations for refusal. In that case, Chair, I'm happy to move the officers' recommendations. Uh, I'd like the officers to have delegated approval to fine tune uh, recommendation three. Uh, and there was another point that Chris raised about the uh, the aspect of this application. Can you remind me what that was, Chris? Yeah, I think. I think, sorry, sorry Councillor Petty. I think if members were concerned about land drainage and wanted to make sure, wanted to take a, a belt and braces approach, I think a scheme for the discharge of surface water from the site um, to include the dwelling house and any and all associated hard landscaping um, shall be submitted to and approved in writing by the local planning authority. And we can, as a, as a precaution, we can run that past the lead local flood authority. They might may not decide not to comment. But I think at least we can have that information, be satisfied it's been appropriately dealt with and considered. Yeah, I th I'd like that. I think that's a prudent, appropriate step, step to take. You know, we used to have floods once every 100 years. Uh, with the inclement weather we're getting now and climate change, we're getting them more frequent. So I think that's a prudent step. So with those two provisos, I'll move the rep recommendations, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Birdie. Councillor Burfoot. Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, I think there are some um, excellent features proposed with this application, such as the air source heat pump. But I'm afraid, in my opinion, this house is just um, too big, basically, and it's uh, not compatible with the surrounding properties. I would have thought a bungalow would have been more appropriate here. Uh, so for, for the reasons of it being out of scale and out of character and doesn't achieve a good relationship with the surrounding properties, I, I will not be voting for this application. Hey, thank you very much, Councillor Burfoot. Councillor Fitzherbert. Thank you, Chairman. Um, well, I, I, as I said earlier, I, I did visit the site today and although I have sympathy with Councillor Burfoot's comments, I'm happy to, to second the recommendation. I think, you know, obviously the applicants spent a great deal of time uh, with the officers, you know, sorting out uh, the actual specifics of, of this house. Um, and they've obviously looked at the fenestration on both uh, number six and number four and the rear of uh, this, this new dwelling. And I think um, they've come to the most satisfactory conclusion they could come to. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, uh, I'm afraid I suspect the ash tree won't last particularly longer because of the dieback in that we've got in this area. Um, uh, and it's also got an awful lot of ivy on it, if, if somebody wants to rescue that. Um, I noticed today, but uh, I'm happy to second uh, the recommendation. And I think, as is outlined in the report, uh, it'd be a pretty, it'd be a pretty uh, greenhouse uh, eco-wise anyway with or without um, panels on the on the southern elevation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Fitzherbert. Councillor Slack. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, um, I think uh, looking at this, it's a lot of work gone into this, and the people have worked with the officers to get the best results, and he saw pump uh, being put in, and I'm pleased that Chris is willing to, to alter the wording for uh, leave a door open for solar panels to be installed. So... I think, yeah, it's, it's all right. It's very good. Yeah, it may be a bit big, but um, this, it's a big piece of land, really. So it, it, it accepts it, really. So, yeah, I am support this very much, so, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Slack. Councillor Bottle. Um, are we going to be fettling the, uh, the wording so that they can get planning permission without having to make an application for a solar panel? Or... I'm not sure if it really matters if we're decarbonising electricity, but nevertheless, it's always good to have let, you know, it's got a nice circular feel, hasn't it? Um, having a, having solar panels on your garage roof with your electric car inside. So uh, if we could uh, fettle, the, uh, fettle the wording, I'd, I'd love that and I shall support it. Thank you very much, Councillor Buttle. I've got nobody else down on my list, so it's been moved and seconded for 
granting of permission, given the two elements that discussed the drainage and also the solar panels. So, Simon, like I say, it's been moved and seconded. Can we go to the vote, please? OK, thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Archer? Or oh. Atkin? Councillor Atkin? Or oh. uh, Bull? Or oh. Burfoot? Against. Buttle? Or oh. Donnelly? Or oh. Elliot? Four. Fitzherbert. Councillor Fitzherbert. I think we've lost Councillor Fitzherbert for the moment. I'll just move to the next one. Um, Councillor Lees. Four. Councillor Morley. Four. Um, Councillor O'Brien. Four. Uh, Councillor Purdy. Four. And Councillor Slack. Four. Okay, uh, just see. Councillor Fitzherbert again. Uh, I didn't quite catch you. Your vote. Four. Thank you. Four. Okay, Chair, that's 12-4-1 um, again, so carried. Um, so that motion's carried. Thank you very much, members. Uh, moving on to the next item. i get my paperwork in order. Uh, this is uh, application 20 stroke 01034. It's a full application. Extension and alteration to existing church and associated building con conversion of chapel house to two number apartments, construction of eight number apartments and demolition of... Uh, I have one speaker on this, and Mr Tony Walker, leader of the AMC development team on behalf of the applicant. You have five minutes and I will indicate when you have 30 seconds left. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all today on behalf of Ashbourne Methodist Church, AMC. Uh, my name is Tony Walker, and I am leader of our link development team. The papers presented by the officers describe our current situation and proposals well, so I will only briefly cover those matters. In summary, AMC is very active, and in our buildings, we have a large range of activities for church and community. Young and old, we also have a cafe, a residential centre, and we are a venue for town events. We have an annual footfall of over 40,000. However, our large Victorian premises have severe issues with three buildings on three different levels, with connection between them being outside and via difficult stairs. We have an attractive but inflexible church space, a lack of medium or smaller rooms, poor toilets and kitchens, inefficient and challenging maintenance and heating issues. In addition, we have difficulties with security, safeguarding children and vulnerable adults, and being COVID secure in what's being called the rabbit warren of buildings. As you can see from the plans, and I think you'll be taken through them, our key proposal is the provision of a new main street level entrance foyer from Station Road, which we are calling The Link. That this will give access to all parts of the premises and unify all the buildings into one complex. The details of our proposals are in the papers and plans you have received. And in summary, these proposals will create a modern set of fully accessible and safe facilities, which, which will provide an inclusive, comfortable and sustainable environment in a heritage set of buildings. Our visions, is that these will become a seven day a week church and community hub. Our housing proposal will create 10 apartments on underutilized land at the back of the church adjacent to the Henmore Brook. This housing is an essential financial contribution for the development and has been sensitively designed with extensive discussion with the council's planning and conservation officers. It has been a long over five year journey to get here, and we have spent £120,000 in the process. 
We first engaged architects in December 2015. We had consultations with church members and with the community in 2016 and 2017. We took three years from 2016 to 2019 to get listed building consent from, our, from the national church. We've had extensive consultation with planning and conservation officers here in Derbyshire Dales from March 2016 until today. In conclusion, following the extensive consultation, we have integrated all the advice that we've been given. We are not developers. We are local people trying to do the right thing. We've not taken the easy option, found a site somewhere else and moved out of town. We would like to stay on our current site, preserve the church and avoid the premises becoming unoccupied. We have worked for five years through many complex issues with advice for, from council officers, and I would like to thank them for that, to be here today with their recommendation for approval. As the Ashbourne Methodist Church, which has contributed to Ashbourne and the surrounding area for over 200 years, we do hope you will be able to approve our application and enable us to continue to contribute for many years into the future. We do believe it will be good for the community, good for our church, and good for the town and surrounding area. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Walker. Uh, John. Thank you, Chair. Um, just before we go into uh, looking at the presentation, if I can just uh, take you to the uh, supplementary sheet. We've got comments from, from two parties. We've got comments from the applicant's agents in terms of the wording of the condition. And you'll see that uh, they've asked for some greater flexibility in terms of the wording of the condition to take account of the fact that there are effectively two elements to this scheme. There are the works to the church buildings and there are the separate works to construct the, the flats in the grounds. And they want those conditions to be sufficiently flexible to allow uh, the, the different parts of the project um, to proceed at slightly different speeds. Um, there's no objection from our perspective in that. There is a, 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 an overriding condition within the scheme that asks for a contract to be in place to do the works to the church before uh, the housing is commenced. And we think that is sufficient to make sure that the whole project does progress. Uh, so, so we would, with uh, committee's agreement, we would like to, uh, authority to tweak the conditions accordingly. Um, what we also have in terms of uh, comments is late comments from the Lead Local Flood Authority. And the Lead Local Flood, Flood Authority have confirmed that they have no objection in principle to this development subject to appropriate conditions which are included in the report. So uh, without further ado, and hopefully smoothly, I will try and take you through um, the rest of the presentation here, if you just bear with me a moment. Yeah. I was getting ended with a screenshot. How do I get rid of this? Yeah, just um, expand that, John. Expand that. It's against the big window. That one. Yeah. Okay, you clicked on this. No, not yet. Yeah. And screen two. That's it. Okay. So you're shutting that screen now. Okay, members, I think hopefully you have a, a screen uh, in front of you now, if I can take you through the, uh, through the slides. Just bear with me, go back one. Okay, so this, this is the, uh, the application site um, within the, the centre of Ashbourne. We've got uh, the main 
elevation of the uh, of Church Street there. That's the current entrance point into the into the church. And obviously, you've also got this elongated site, uh, fairly typical of Ashbourne, a Burgage plot, historically, um, with a, an elevation to Station Street. So you've got the main church building fronting out onto Church Street, and you've got other buildings that front onto Station Street. Let me just carry on through these, the red line of the application site. Um, you can see the buildings here. We've got the main church building, Grade 2 listed. Uh, we've got the Centenary Hall that I'm highlighting, Grade 2 listed. We've also got other buildings that benefit from curtilage listing in, in terms of the, the building on the corner where the cafe currently sits. There's a, a shop, small shop that fronts onto Station Road. And there's also the chapel house, which is uh, a dwelling at the back of the site. There's a hut within the, the back of the site here, a fairly rudimentary hut. Um, and when we come onto the photographic images, you'll see we've got vegetation uh, along the brook side here, along Hemmore Brook. Um, and in particular, we've got a quite impressive uh, beech tree that we will uh, come on to in due course. Um, this is uh, an illustration of what's proposed in plan form. So what you can see here is a, an extension building that links the main church building uh, to cent the Century Hall and also to the corner building. Um, we've got a, a further extension building round, round the back of, of that. We've also got, you can see in plan form there, we've got uh, the apartments which stretch down the eastern boundary of the of the site with a two-story element, the conversion of the chapel house is part of that and a link between the two. And then we've got a uh, apartments at the back of the site that face back onto the river. Along sorry, the sorry, John. Sorry, jo sorry, John. I, I, I'm not seeing anything. I don't know about others. I mean, I have had problems with my computer earlier. Yeah, well, I'm seeing it. About others. Yeah, I can see it. You can see it. Okay, I'll, I'll look. Okay, so, sorry about that technical diff difficulty, Councillor Fitzherbert. Hopefully uh, the picture resumes in due course. Um, okay, so we've got the apartments that, that face onto the river. Um, we'll come on then to the, to the detail of the scheme. It's not great on the bottom of the screen there, but we'll come on to it. Uh, so this is the view that you will get um, of Station Road here. You can see the, the building on the corner, the, the cafe at the moment, the Century Hall. In the background there, the main church church building. And you can see how the extension will, will sit in between those. Um, you'll also see, um, albeit with, it's a section this, so it's not a, not a true view. You can see the section of the small shop building and how the, um, the flats will sit on the bottom part of, part of the site. Um, also on the bottom of the screen there, um, that is looking back in the other direction towards the, the, the back of the hall there, and you can see how the apartments along the eastern boundary sit there. Okay, so here we have a, a sectional drawing, um, and this is this is looking through, through the, the main uh, Methodist church here. Um, and through through the, the the corner building, looking down the site, and what you can see on this drawing is how the extension, um, how the extension sits. It sits at slightly lower than street level on Station Road, and what you end up with is a building that that gives ready access into uh, the side of the main church, coming in from that that western elevation. You'll see also on this section how the glazed roof immediately alongside the church building uh, meets the church at the transom of the windows. And beyond that, you've got a, a zinc roof, um, which comes down to a, a glazed, glazed frontage there. It's on two levels. So at lower ground floor, you get, you get meeting rooms and upstairs you get a, get a lobby area. And the image below, that's, that's giving you the view from Station Road. Um, so you can see there how the glazed roof will meet the main church building and how the, the structure in front um, sits there and creates two storeys. This is Chapel House, um, fairly 
simple building that sits on the back of the site, an earlier scheme um, that, that we wouldn't support did involve removing this, this curtilage list of building. Um, in the revised scheme, the applicants have agreed to, uh, to utilise this building and to convert it. It's converted into two flats. And you can see here, there is some adaptation of that building. There's a little glass balustrade coming in, uh, adaptations of the windows to turn that building, reuse it as two apartments alongside. You've got a two story building uh, and then a single story building where it, where it bounds. Uh, I think it's called Lambourne House, the, the property alongside. Um, that's the view looking back from that adjoining property to the east. At the bottom of the image here, um, these, these images don't do, do justice to the architecture, unfortunately, because of the reproduction, but you've got a fairly simple but robust two-story building um, in, of contrasting simplicity to the, to the grandeur of the church building. I think that's the, the philosophy here in terms of how it's been approached. Okay, so um, again, this is illustrations of, of the main um, church building. This is looking from the east. Uh, sort of around the back of the building, if, if you like. Um, this is looking back from the river, and we've talked about there being a two-storey replacement building here to, uh, to help form the toilets and meet the levels. Um, you can see a, a, a view through alongside the main frontage there. There's a little brick wall that you'll get a, a, a glimpsed view of that ties in partway down the main church building. And then looking from Station Road, Again, you've got this this image of the of the glazed the gla glazed roof alongside the building, and then the zinc roof that sits in front of that. Um, okay, Again, I think we've sort of got a feel of that. That's how the building sits in floor plan, and helps to link all of the the elements of the church buildings. And this is the the first floor plan. This is where you go in effectively um, at street level, and then go up a set of stairs. And get access into the side of the of the um, the main worshiping space space here through a new set of double doors, with a further door at one end there. Um, when we look at the list of building consent application, it refers also to the formation of a screen along this wall and the reorganisation of the pews within within the main church church building. Okay, um, so here you can see how the, the flat, flatted buildings, this is Chapel House in the top left-hand corner. You can see how the flatted buildings then sit alongside that and stretch back into the Burgage plot. Um, the, the house to, to the north, uh, sorry, it's actually to the east, but it sort of looks like it's to the, to the north on this image, to the top of the image there. Um, we'll see a photograph of that in due course. You've got a, a builder's yard that sits along the remainder of um, that eastern boundary. So what you'll see from the river on that northeastern corner is a gable elevation and then you see um, to the to the west of that you will see the elevation of the um, the secondary block there. We've taken advice um, on the pre precise form of excavation and the excavation of this building can be done without affecting the future health of the uh, of the beech tree. Okay, that's the, the first floor of those. So you've got a two-story element, single story, two-story for, the, for the, the block coming down to the west. Um, this shows the internal reorganization of the worship space. Um, so we, we build in flexibility in terms of that, how that can be used by being able to come in from, from the side. And we've got some of the images here. I'll run you through these. So this is the main side elevation of the, of the church, looking from Station Road, Century Hall to the, uh, to the right of the image there, the, the corner building on the other side. This is the uh, boundary wall and railing that's referred to in the report in terms of having to make openings in that to facilitate the new foyer building. You can see the line of the, of the transom on that window. That is the, the line at which Point, the, the glazed roof will, will tie into the building. Uh, we have full details of that. Uh, we're convinced it can work without causing uh, any damage to the, to the fabric of the building in terms of making that, that feasible. 
Um, this is looking back towards the, the corner frontage there, looking back to the to the corner house. And you can see that we, in terms of that elevation, you've got sort of secondary windows at, at the lower level. They don't have the, the grandeur of, of the, the church windows that, that sit above. They will be obscured by, by the project. You won't be able to see those. This is the Century Hall. Again, contrasting, but really very attractive architecture in its own right. And the, the building will have a glazed link between uh, the new foyer space and the, the Century Hall. So none of, none of the elevation there will be, uh, will be damaged by, by this project. Here we have um, the back of the building. This is, this is chapel, the chapel house. Um, looking at the back of the building. This is the building that's going to be converted into two apartments with a little glass balustrade created at first floor level. So it's good to see that building, which is re relatively modest in, in its uh, proportions and, and styling. Good to see it reused as part of the project. Okay, so the, the photographs hopefully will help you appreciate the project. In the report, we refer to the demolition of a hut. This is the, the hut building that will be demolished. As you can see, it, it's very much of its time, uh, no doubt being used by lots of community groups over the, over the years. It's better days. This is the bridge over the, the Hemmore at this point, and although it's not in leaf, at the moment a rather uh, lovely beech tree that, that sits there and helps to define the street scene. So that tree will, will stay. Some of the other vegetation needs to come out to accommodate um, the new, the new properties. This is looking back towards the end of the Century Hall, and that's the, where we're going to have the replacement two-storey extension there to, to link the buildings together. Um, this is looking down the back. Uh, there's an existing stair, stairwell there between the Century Hall and this building. On the right is the, uh, the small shop, which is going to be utilised for, for storage. This is looking across at the property to, to the east of the site. Um, and this is a, a building that sits within its wider curtilage. That's a storage building. Um, this building has been recently extended. Where the development backs onto this, it's designed to be single story with a, with a fence brought up to two meters to, um, to try and protect the amenity of that particular property whose main outlook is actually back out over, over the, the river. Um, and this is looking alongside the bridge. You can see the hut in the over the river there, the, the tree that we've talked about, um, and the, the house to the to the east of that. Okay, so I think um, that's all I need to say on that. I'm happy to take uh, happy to take member questions. Yeah, thank you very much, John. So the first person on my list is Councillor Gary Purdy. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, John. Uh, well, I'm well aware of this building, but I've just been looking at it on my iMac behind on Google Earth, and um, it's a real imposing building. Um, I've got no objection to contemporary. I remember many years ago being on Princess Street in Edinburgh and seeing a link similar to this, and I thought it worked well. But a couple of questions, or three. Um, Noting 5.7 from Historic England, they raised some serious concerns, John and then pass the bat to us and say, it's up to you. Um, and of course, our conservation officers responded accordingly. Um, what weight have we given to Historic England's concerns? Because they do say it would result in harm to the significance of the Grade Two Methodist Church and the Aspen Conservation Area. Um, I appreciate that this kind of application needs to look at the overall benefit against some harm uh, and I've got no problem with that. Um, how much green space is being lost? Um, and I think what part of the church, looking at the Google Earth again, which part of the building is being demolished? I know you said that little building at the back, but I think you're in the report is also something about part of the church being demolished and that's to create the link, is it? So concern about what Historic England is saying, have we weighed that view uh, with our own officer? Um, the loss of space, green, and what part is coming down? Yeah, 
Okay, I've gone, gone back in the images. Hopefully uh, you can still see this, but uh, this is the little link at the moment that is going to be going to come down and replaced with something of uh, almost exactly the same uh, dimensions, but with a small parapet here rather than a, and a pitch roof. Um, you can see that that's been adapted over time. It's had a brick infill at the lower level. We don't mm. think that's of any major significance. The other, the other building that is to be demolished um, is, is this hut building at the back, which doesn't benefit from, from a listing and, and arguably is detrimental to the setting of the wider group. So actually the loss of that building could be argued to be a, a benefit. In terms, of, in terms of where the concern of, I'm going to try and find you the, the images, in terms of the con main concerns of um, historic England, uh, the way we've interpreted it is their main concern involves the, the interruption to this side view of, of the church building. Uh, I don't have an image, unfortunately, of the front of the church. The front of the church is really quite, quite ornate and, and, and splendid. Uh, this is an attractive elevation. Um, you heard from the, the, from the speaker on this that the dilemma that the church face uh, in terms of utilising all of these different buildings is they're all they're poor, poorly connected to one another. Um, they're quite expensive to run. They're not flexible. They don't have the right number of community rooms to be able to, uh, to generate the income they want for the upkeep of, of those buildings. So there, there will be an impact certainly on the on the, the side elevation by introducing a glazed roof, which uh, touches the buildings on that transom point there. Um, the benefit of the glazed roof, though, is that when you're in the internal space, you'd be able to see the lower portion of that window still. Um, and al although we, we've had due regard to um, to what Historic England have had to say, I think we feel that given the practicalities of trying to put these listed buildings to a continued viable and beneficial use, given that requirement and, and, and the, the obvious place to try and extend the building to make that happen is to do it in this, this, this sunken area. We think the extension has been designed as skillfully as it could be to minimize the impact on the listed building. So we're not saying there's no impact, but we're saying that when you weigh that in the balance, that impact on the building is, in our view, significantly outweighed by the overall benefits of bringing these buildings into uh, real um, core of the community uses. Um, thank you, John. Thank you, Chair. Uh, as, as Tony, the speaker, explained, obviously, a lot of work gone on to this over a number of years. I think five was said. So um, just the point about the green space, John. Yeah, uh, the, there is modest green space at the, uh, at the back of the buildings. Um, it's not particularly used, and the photograph that we've got isn't isn't very good. But just beyond th that that building sits just within the site. There's a, an area alongside the edge of the river here, and then just going around the corner, which is sort of available for people that are currently using the facilities. Unfortunately, you know, one of the costs of making this a, a viable project is that we were having to accept the apartment buildings in the back of the site that that's a comp that's a compromise in terms of, of, of heritage but we think it's a well-designed compromise because it's reflecting the sort of scale and positioning of buildings that you might typically get in one of Ashbourne's burgage plots so we feel again um, to make the project stack up we, we have to accept something here but the harm isn't um, too significant and is outweighed by the benefits. Thank you John, thank you Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor O'Brien. Thank you, thank you, Chair. And to just follow up from Councillor Purdy's first point, which I think was very, very pertinent. Um, and I, I, I do always have regard to what Historic England say. And if they say that a, a, a development is going to harm Arm the listed building and the conservation area. I do, I do take that seriously, and I, I can understand the reasons that they say that. And I think John, you you explained them. M my question is, in the light of those concerns, have you asked the applicant and their architect to look 
as an alternative design solution, which provides a, a roof uh, design which doesn't interrupt the fenestration, the, the, the windows to the first floor of the, the main church. Have you actually asked them to look at an alternative which comes to terms with the uh, concerns of historic England? Yeah, I, I think I think we, we can't unfortunately present you as part of dealing with this application with all that's gone before. And I think if we were able to do um, to do that, you would see that there's been exhaustive discussions to try and come up with a scheme which minimised any harm. And we consider this that you know of the schemes that we've looked at to be um, the one that does minimise the, the the harm. Um, so it's not it's not a it's not an admission that there's no harm. There is some harm in terms of how you appreciate the building from Station Road. But, but given the desirability of of linking all of the buildings and bringing them back into or or maximising their community use, we think that that uh, that harm is justified in this particular case. OK, thank you very much. Councillor Lees. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, just regarding a couple of points, There's one with the, the glazed screen, yeah, I, I do uh, sympathise with what um, the list of building people are saying, etc. But I, I, I believe that the benefits far outweigh the negatives. I mean, anybody that knows this site, if you look over the, we haven't got no pictures out, over the railings, it's quite a bland paved area, which has got no use, just weeds and etc. that grows over that wall. And I think it'll, um, it'll it'll do it justice the building rather than the, the negatives on it. Uh, the only other question is what what is going to be the main access route for all the construction work at the back? Uh, good question, Count Councillor Lees. Um, that hasn't been discussed so so far. I think it would make make sense to uh, if that's not not already in the conditions that we we condition that to make sure that uh, any impact on on the listed buildings, the listed structures, but also the, the tree that we want to preserve at the back of the site is uh, that we make sure that, that everything's preserved. Yeah, thank you, because I, I can see that it's quite a steep, it, it's quite a steep incline down at the side of the shop. And I should say the only relatively easy way in is through the Ex builders yard down the side, down the, the far side, the back side, like rather than off the station road itself. Yeah, I mean that that would be one option. It would obviously require the uh, the agreement of a third party, but I think we can legitimately put a uh, put a condition on to to cover that point. Yeah, because it is it is going to be quite a lengthy construction process of uh, doing that build. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Lees. Councillor Slack. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I do realise, John, that um, these buildings have been put up at different times. Uh, the, the bits of buildings here or there. And to try and... It's a, quite a job, isn't it, to try and link them all together and get it exactly right. Uh, I do appreciate what uh, the heritage people are saying, it, it, but it's a very difficult job to uh, get it exactly right. The only real concern, really is the uh, big glazing area, the uh, uh, the side, which uh, will it, um, one question is, will it, uh, with the summertime sun, will it flow blur into traffic on that street? I'm just looking at it now. I, you know, it could possibly do, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see, but um, yeah, it's a very difficult way. Uh, I think all in all, I think they've got the best they can do with it, really. And uh, I think uh, officers have got it right. They just, uh, it's not perfect, but uh, it's as good as we can get it. And it is a historical site, as we all know. It's, it's a landmark of Ashbourne. It's been there many years. So it does need to, it would be terrible to this, to run into disuse and, and be uh, empty. So uh, I'm fully supportive of it. Uh, but it's just that issue about the, Glare from a grass. It's quite a big area of glazing there, isn't it, on the side? And I wondered uh, if you'd have done a study on it, whether there is glare to traffic. Um, well, perhaps I can just go back to the image that shows that elevation, if possible. And it's not the images aren't aren't brilliant. Of, of, no. of, I mean, the one 
if you see the top image there, this is what you see from mm. Station Road. So you've you've got the the glazing which sits alongside and and, and marries into the the transom of the those those top windows. Um, that's set at a, at an angle. I doubt there'll be any obvious glare. Um, and then you've got the glazing of the the front of the of the foyer building. Um, I'm sure that's something that the the architects and the, the, the site yeah. can take mm -hmm. into account in terms of the specification for the the actual glazing that they install. Yeah, thank you, John. Thank you very much, Councillor Fitzherbert. Yeah, hello. Sorry, I'm, I'm losing bandwidth, so I've turned my video off to help. Um, but uh, my my question is really about parking, and I've read in the report on. Um, uh, at uh, 7.29 on page 30 of the report about highway safety in that it says um, uh, there's car parking provision on the streets and things like that. Well, and there's public car parks, you know, Derbyshire Dales run car parks locally uh, and there's the Sainsbury's one and the one at the leisure centre, uh, very adjacent. So, you know, I take the points on board and we've got to do something with this building. Um, uh, but... Uh, and it, and it mentions parking on the street. Uh, my, my question is really, is, is that sufficient? And my supplementary question is, um, uh, I'm concerned, and I'm sure the Ashbourne councillors will be concerned about access during the works for this project. And has that been uh, thought through as well, please? Thank you. Yes, Councillor Fitzherbert. In terms of the parking situation, um, this site is what it is. It, it doesn't have available uh, off-street parking so um, whoever occupies the flats will need to take that into account in terms of their decision to either purchase or rent one of these particular units. Um, the, church, the church building itself doesn't have any any parking at the moment so that's that's not a change and people do rely on, on public parking facilities to within this town centre location and um, the highway authority are normally quite relaxed about that making good use of brownfield sites in town centres and not requiring uh, extensive parking, which often serves to stymie uh, effective re redevelopment. Um, in terms of gaining access to the site and, and construction materials and everything else, I think Councillor Lee's picked up on this point and we've suggested that we, we actually uh, put a condition on to cover that point. Um, it is possible to, to get get around the, the back of the site either from from the east if if we had a, a willing third party or possibly even from the street side uh, even though there's a there's a, a drop in levels there on the just alongside the the beach beach tree at the uh, the far corner of the site that's possible to get in at that corner but clearly it's challenging and it's something that needs some careful consideration but um, not an uncommon problem, I have to say, in some of our tighter town and village centres in terms of how you deal with construction traffic, but it can be cracked. Hey, thank you very much. Councillor Buckley. I think it's absolutely lovely. I think they've done a fantastic job. I think if, it's, uh, if Officer Bradbury was part of setting it all out and getting it all together, and I, I think he deserves congratulations. I think it's an improvement over what was there before. Uh, the front of the building is fantastic and the side of the building is fine. And I think this link building will be really nice when you're inside it. You'll go into it and you'll look up and you'll see the windows below and above. I think it's an absolute cracker of a design. And I think you know, they should get on with it. And um, the thing that I'm a bit baffled about is how do you actually get in there? Now, I can see that there's those steps going down. I went and had a good, good look round yesterday and uh, I thought it was, you know, like, it's definitely in need of doing, but what, how are people going to actually get in and out? Uh, okay, Councillor Butler, I'll, I'll cover that point first. Um, you, can, you can see that we've, we're going to both have a set of steps um, from Station Road. So we talked about, there's a listed, listed wall along the frontage here, which unfortunately has to be breached at two points, one to get steps down to get into the foyer, but also to at the other end to provide a ramp which would run down from the edge of the corner house there to get into the site. So it will it will have an attractive um, frontage within within the street scene. Um, 
Thank you very much for your praise. I have to deflect most of that in the direction of the of the case officers, of whom there have been quite a few in the, in the last couple of years working alongside the developer to knock this one into shape. Um, it, it, is, it is a testament to the benefit of proactive pre-application discussions because this was always going to be a tricky one to crack. And, it, and it's great credit to all concerned that uh, we've come to this conclusion, I think. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Bull. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, no questions now. Uh, my question was answered as regards car parking and the likes. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you very much. Now I'm going to move into debate. Councillor Archer. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, first of all, I'm, I'm happy to move this um, this recommendation. Uh, my my view on it is it is a really complex site, but I, I completely echo what Councillor Buttle said and um, what, what Officer Bradley said as well. And I think the developers have done an absolutely fantastic job. And, and I actually think, it, it, although there are historic England's concerns, I understand they are talking about the impact on the original building. I do actually think this will end up as a, a lovely blend between historic building and, and, a, and a modern extension. I think the glazing will actually enhance it. I think it'll be a lovely space to be inside. I, I've been in this building many times for various events um, and it will be a tragedy if it was to fall into misuse. Um, you know, the people who are developing it or the people who, who, who've used this building for generations, they understand its history. They understand what it's all about. They want to preserve it for the town. Um, and I completely support them with that. I think it's actually just, just the sort of thing Ashbourne needs. It's going to keep the, the high street appealing, bring people into the town, more residents living in the town centre who can access the town centre shops on high street on foot. Um, and it's really doing a lot to try and preserve the history while making that history future proof so the building itself can be maintained. Um, I just think it's a, a real testament to the work of the developers, the, um, the, the church group, um, the, the officers in providing Ashbourne with, a, with a, a community asset which will last for generations to come and be used by thousands and thousands of people. So I, I think they've done a great job with a really potentially difficult site and, and it has my full support and I would like to move it. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Councillor Archer. Councillor Donnelly. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I was going to move, but um, I'm glad Mr Archer has done the same thing. Um, yes, I do welcome this um, application. I know, as Mr Walker said, it's been a long time getting to, to us this evening. Um, as a ward member, I know that they are very well. And again, as Councillor Archer said, I think they've done a, a fantastic job in the, in the development stages. And I also would say that is much in keeping with the area of, of that part of Ashbourne. And again, I know what a great benefit that, um, and how much it will be supported in that community. So all I can say is I wish them well, and I'm happy to second the application. Thank you very much, Councillor Donnelly. Councillor Lees. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I was either going to second it or as well as, but uh, yeah, I'm fully supportive of this uh, application. I think it'd be very good for the area. Uh, as uh, as you know, we've been there quite a few times. I know the building quite well and its its uses, and it, it's very supportive for both young and uh, older generations. So I'm full support of this application. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Lees. Councillor Fitzherbert. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to endorse everything that has been said here. I mean, it, it's, it's no small feat to spend £120,000 on a planning application, and it hasn't gone through yet. We've still got a few minutes to wait, obviously. Uh, but the investment uh, in this building, the resurgence of this building is what I'm all about. As your heritage champion for Derbyshire Dells, I'm actually passionate about all our heritage properties, not just in the Derbyshire Dells, but uh, those of us that live in the, in the National Park part of the, of the Derbyshire Dells. And it's essential that we champion this and get this um, out there uh, because it's not just going to uh, benefit, it's not just going to benefit um, church goes, it's going to uh, benefit all the population of Ashbourne and the surrounding districts. And I can see this being a huge hub and a huge attraction to bring people into the town when you only have to walk 100 yards up the street and all the shops are boarded up. Uh, those are some will open, but many will not reopen shortly. Uh, congratulations to everyone at the church who have done this. Thank you very much, Councillor Fitzherbert. But the last one on my list before we go to the vote is Councillor Slack. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I echo, echo what uh, Councillor Archer and the other uh, council have already said. I think it's a, really an asset that uh, Ashburn's got here, and it's a historical asset, and it would be disastrous to see it close and, and disintegrate. Uh, it is on the community, especially, uh, same as uh, Mr Walker said, it's a seven-day activity going on here and uh, for the community. So it's, it's all about community as well as... Uh, historical aspect of it and uh, uh, the community will thrive in this especially as we come out of lockdown and we get back to normal this is the place that we're going to need the churches and community to help communities through then as we go forward thank you chair thank you very much councillor zach so um, it's been moved and seconded for approval notwithstanding um the conditions for site uh, traffic entrance and um, the tweaks that John alluded to. So uh, it's been moved and seconded for approval. Simon, can we go to the vote, please? Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Archer? For. Atkin? For. Paul? For. Burfoot? For. Russell? For. Donnelly? For. Elliot. For. Fitzherbert. For. Lees. For. Morley. For. O'Brien. For. Purdy. For. And Slack. For. Okay, that's unanimous, Chair. Okay, so that's been granted. So moving on, uh, the next application is application number 20 stroke 01035. This is listed building consent. It's Ashbourne Methodist Church, Church Street, Ashbourne, and it's for external, internal, external alterations to existing church, associated builders and chapel house. John. Thank you, Chair. Um, I won't take you through all of the, uh, the images again. Um, as you know, in the planning system, there's an overlap between when you need planning permission and when you need list of building consent um, in applications such as these. So the extensions to the building uh, all require list of building consent. Uh, the development in the grounds, i.e. the flats, they're not part of this application, but the um, some of the changes to the list of buildings in terms of creating new openings and reord reordering the internal space also require list of building consent. Um, I heard what was said by uh, Mr. Walker earlier, and it may well be that some of those have already received consent under the ecclesiastical exemption scheme. Um, notwithstanding that, uh, in, in its totality, uh, we think that the benefits to the listed buildings of the extensions and alterations uh, outweigh any less than substantial harm that's, that's caused by the proposals, and the officer recommendation is one of approval. Okay, thank you very much, John. Members, questions? Chair, no questions. I think it's prudent to move the recommendation. Okay, so... I think I've Council got... Birdie. Excuse me, I've, I think I may have a question here. Well then, Council Buttle. Um, I notice on the front of the building there's some netting and spikes to stop birds nesting. Would they, would they be planning on putting more of that netting up above the windows where the, where the new amount of glass and glazing is going to be? Because I'm not sure that would be helping, even if it might stop the dirt birds making a mess. There's nothing suggested within this application. Um, I mean, something such as netting where it's easily removable, uh, we would have to debate that with with the, the building owners as to whether that actually required listed building consent in the, fir the first place. But uh, there's certainly nothing proposed as part of this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So um, we've into debate, Councillor Purdy's moved it. Councillor Donnelly. Oh, thank you, Chair. Yes, I'm happy to move the application. I said, I think it's a um, fantastic project. So I really hope it goes well. Thank you very much. Councillor Burfoot. Oh, Councillor Bull, should I say? No, it wasn't me, no. 
that it's council, but I can only see a B after Sue, so I just automatically <laughs> presumed it was you, Sue. Sorry. But I think it's brilliant scheme. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, obviously, I was going to offer to second it, um, uh, obviously, as uh, John has, has stipulated that, obviously, uh, the uh, listed buildings consent has to be given as well. But uh, considering we've, we've gone through the other situation and there has been a lot of working and cohesion with each other to already get this off the ground. Uh, and they're obviously just waiting for us to say yay or nay. Well, we've obviously given the consent for the uh, previous uh, application on the full. So I, I think I, it's only right that this should carry on. Um, and I'm, I'm sure it will all be done in very good taste. So I'm quite happy with it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Bull. So it's been moved and seconded for approval. Simon, can we go to the vote, please? Okay, thank you, Chair. Okay, then, uh, Councillor Archer. For. Atkin. For. Bull. For. Burfoot. For. Buttle. For. Donnelly. Elliot. For. Fitzherbert. For. Lees. For. Morley. For. O'Brien. For. <clears throat> Purdy. For. And Slack. For. Okay, again, unanimous chair. Okay, so that's been um, approved. So moving swiftly on, the last substantial uh, bit of business for tonight. Uh, it's application 20 stroke 01139. It's reserved matters. It's land adjacent to Hilltop, Derby Road, Ashbourne. Uh, as you know, it's a reserved matters application for approval of the appearance, landscaping, layout and scale of residential development of 36 dwelling houses. Outline planning consent reference 16 stroke 00711 out. Uh, I have two speakers on this. The first speaker on my list is Mr. Peter Dobbs, a local resident, to comment on the application. You have three minutes and I will indicate when you have 30 seconds left. Over to you, Mr. Dobbs. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for com committee for letting me speak in person. Um, I've got a question and some comments. The question might have been overlooked first time, so I would like to perhaps restate it with more clarity. Uh, in the current planning application process, who decides whether the facilities for pedestrians are fit for purpose? Is it DCC as the Highways Authority or the District Council planning officers and this committee? Because it would seem that in planning, trees, bats, butterflies get excellent advocacy, but pedestrians, surely the key people in a greener future, seem to be largely ignored. In every application, including this one, the County Council will give comments on highway safety, but what they say appears to be largely limited to cars and refuse trucks. For this application, how is it regarded as acceptable that a pedestrian leaving this development has immediately to cross what is a very busy road with average annual daily traffic estimated to be 6,300 by 2025. There is no central refuge at this point and the only pavement on this stretch of Derby Road is on the other side. How is it acceptable for someone wishing to catch a bus to Ashbourne to have to cross this busy road twice or to walk to the nearest school to have to cross the same road twice, perhaps with a toddler and a buggy. Considering that the dangers in crossing Derby Road have already been brought to the attention of county councillors, why is the suggestion that building a pavement all the way round this estate, but stopping it immediately you reach a busy road, was found by the local highways authority to be acceptable in principle? I would like to think that any linking of pedestrians and Derby Road Ashbourne would trigger an alarm. This development adjoins, adjoins another, David Wilson Homes. Is it not possible to request that some pedestrian access is created through this so that a safe way to get to old Derby Road and the bus stops on foot is provided? 
Perhaps an officer is going to tell me that I should have made this point at outline planning stage. However, it still begs the question, who's championing the pedestrian at every stage of the planning process? Thank you. 30 seconds left. <clears throat> Thank you very much. The next on my list is Miss Rebecca Beardsley. She's the agent to speak in favour. And you have five minutes. And I'll indicate when you have 30 seconds left. Thank you, Chair. My name is Rebecca Beardsley and I'm a senior planner at 1947 and I represent the applicant Cameron Holmes. Firstly, I would like to state that I agree with the case presented in the officer's report and the conclusions reached. This reserve matters application proposes the development of 36 new homes. The outline application for up to 37 dwellings was granted by this committee in February 2017 and as such, the principle of the development has already been established. Cameron Homes, who are developing the sites, are a smaller house builder with most of their sites focused in and around Derbyshire. Other schemes you may be familiar with, which they are developing currently, are Acorn Meadows in Brailsford and Woodgate Point in Hull and Ward. Prior to the submission of the application, detailed pre-application discussions were undertaken with your officers, and this has informed the design of the scheme and the housing mix. The proposal overall provides a good mix of homes which is suitable for first-time buyers, families looking for larger homes and also people seeking to downsize. It is considered that the scheme caters for a wide range of households within the district and that the mix is in line with what was agreed at the pre-application stage. Discussions were held throughout the consultation period with consultees and all technical queries have since been addressed. The technical points raised by highways have also been addressed and highways are now satisfied with the scheme. In response to the points raised by Mr. Dobbs, pedestrian safety is to be ensured via tactile crossing, which is going to be installed and to be constructed to current Derbyshire County Council standards, as well as a footway which is being provided along the front of the site in compliance with condition seven of the outline consent. Furthermore, highways have raised no objection and there was no fundamental issue with any highways matters at the outline stage. We have also liaised in depth with the tree and landscape officer to ensure that a scheme was developed which protects the high quality trees on site whilst replacing the poorer quality trees with the more resilient native species. Overall, the design incorporates a good level of green space which will help to enhance the biodiversity on site as well as providing a good level of amenity for future residents to enjoy. The layout and house type details have also been amended from what was first submitted in line with the comments from the officer, which we were happy to adhere to. The development will also seek to respond positively to the challenge of climate change. This has been considered through the design process and it is thought that it, this has been addressed through incorporating the following measures. Um, use of sustainable drainage systems, planting a large number of trees and other landscaping which will help to capture carbon dioxide and provide cooling shade in warmer months, a large number of southern facing roof slopes which are optimum for solar panels. Cameron Homes also seek to source local materials firstly wherever possible. Energy efficiency is being promoted through the design of the properties to reduce heat loss, water usage will be limited and low energy lighting will be installed throughout. In summary, this reserve matters application fully accords with both local and national planning policy and all technical matters have been fully resolved. We have worked proactively with the council on this site to, to design a development which all parties are happy with. It is therefore respectfully requested that members grant planning permission for this application. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Right. Questions? Councillor Burfoot. Oh, sorry. Should I go, I'll go to Chris first, the officer? Yeah. yeah thank, thank you, Chair. Um, just before we go through um, the committee presentation, just to set out the proposal and the, um, the site to members, um, just draw your attention to the late representation sheet and the, um, the comments that we received. The first item being um, comments from the applicant to address um, some discrepancies with the plans that have been submitted. So if members were minor to approve this application, it is with the revised list, list of drawings presented on that late representation sheet. 
Um, the second item relates to comments received from the, the local highway authority in respect of the reserve matters. And just to clarify to members, the reserve matters that you're considering this evening are the scale of the development, the layout of the development, the external appearance of the development, and access, but only insofar as the details of the internal road layout and the landscaping of the site. So we can go through um, the scope of this application when we go through the presentation. So that's the, se the second item. And the third item is the, um, the comments and the representations received from the, the first speaker, Mr. Dodds. And I think he articulated his points very well in his, his address to, to, to members. So we can, I'm sure questions will arise from what he said, and I'll try and address some of the comments he made in, in the presentation to you. So I'll start, start the presentation and begin to share my screen. Okay, so you should see there um, the details of the application. So what, what we're dealing with this evening is the reserve matters for the approval of appearance, landscaping, layout and scale for residential development of 36 numbered dwelling houses. And the outline consent is the 16 forward slash 00711 slash out application. Now, that outline application was approved and the decision issued on the 3rd of December 2019. And the permission was um, outline consent for up to 37 dwellings on site. So this application is within the scope of that outline permission and the proposal that's before members this evening is for a development of 36 houses. Now the application site is a little over one hectare in area. Uh, members will note from this um, ordnance survey plan that the site is out, outlined in hatched pink. Um, it sits immediately adjacent to the David Wilson's homes development. And there's um, an image later on in the presentation that shows the relationship of this site with, with that adjacent development. Um, you've got the airfield industrial estate on the opposite side of the A52. And we're right on the edge, southeastern edge of, of the settlement here. Um, so outline permission has been granted for residential development on the site for up to 37 dwellings. And we're considering the, the, the reserve matters that, that are reserved as part of that, that initial consent. So we've got here an indicative, well, the, the proposed site layout. You can see there the layout of those 36 dwellings. Um, you can see the extent of, of tree planting proposed as part of this application. Um, just so members are aware, there are groups of protected trees on the roadside frontage, and there is a tree protection plan, which I'll share with you in a moment. There are um, further mature trees, protected trees um, to the south western boundary of the site. And there are also um, some replacement but protected trees within the main body of the site. There's a photograph of those later on, which I'll show you. But you get a general feel for the layout of development. You've got a mixture of houses in terms of semi-detached and detached properties. You've got a cranks house here. Um, you've got a terrace in this location. And you've got further terraces at the bottom end of the site. And there is also a woodland belt along the eastern and screens flickering on and off. Okay, um, John's just mentioned to me that his screen is um, flicking on and off, and he just wondered if that's a common problem with other members. Can everyone hear me and, um, and see the presentation? Yeah. I can see the presentation, thanks, Chris. But I have people yeah. have been having problems. Okay, well, if anyone if anyone is struggling to hear me or can't see the presentation, just let me know, and we can we can try and stop that. Um, so there is a a tree line from um, to the east and um, southeast of the site and the proposal is to retain that and to form a, um, a woodland, a, a modest to be fair, woodland trail around the back of these properties at the southern end of the site and within that space there'll be um, some play equipment and informal sort of play area within that wooded area and um, a formal sort of area of public open space in this, this part of the site at the southern, southern um, boundary. Um, this is the tree protection plan. So you can see here the extent of sort of tree protection and new planting that's proposed. You've got the attenuation basin um, at the northern end of the site at the entrance to, um, to this development. And then you've got tree protection um, along the, the main road frontage. You've got the protection of the trees on the southwestern boundary and retention and, and protection of the wood, wooded area at the southern end of the site with the, the A52. 
this is the tree protection plan in more detail, which sets the um, the boundaries and the root protection areas for the trees where the, the fencing will be located to protect those those trees. Um, you've got an avenue of trees along the access road to existing farm um, buildings and a, a farmhouse um, to the northwest of the site. And this gives you a, an idea as to the relationship of the, the site with the adjacent David Wilson's home development. You'll note that that's a development of over 200 houses and you can see it's got a very close um, connection physically with, with that development and it, it does read as being part of that, that development in, in aerial terms. So to give you an idea as to the design of the houses, um, there has been amendments to, um, to this street elevation. So where you can see the rendered um, first storage to the, the gable projections to the front of the houses, that's been omitted now. So the development is being constru constructed exclusively of red brick um, with plain clay tiles to the roof. There is a simplicity to the design of the, the properties. They're fairly traditional in their design, fairly simple in terms of their forms. Some of them have projecting gable details and, and, and feature bay windows, but that gives you an idea as to the design of, of, of the properties. We've got two street scenes there. And then we've got the individual house types. So we've got bungalows on the site, modest bungalows, we've got modest two bedroom houses, three bedroom property. And then we've got larger three bedroom detached and um, four bedroom properties on the site. Now, just to break down the overall mix, um, there was a condition on the original outline that did prescribe a housing mix to accord with policy HC11 of our local plan. And the housing mix is set out um, for members at section 2.3 of the officer's report. So you can see there that in terms of one bedroom properties, we're, we're delivering two one bedroom properties on the site. We're delivering 12 two bedroom properties. 18 three bedroom properties and only four four bed properties. So we're getting very close to the, the housing mix that's prescribed in the adopted local plan. I think it's worth pointing out as part of the application that eight affordable dwellings will be delivered on site. Now, when this application was approved um, at committee, the local plan requirement was for 45% provision of affordable housing um, to be delivered. Now that, that percentage is being delivered, but a split of on-site provision, so eight units on site, which roughly equates to 22%, and then the remainder of that provision to be delivered in the form of an off-site financial contribution. And that's all set out to members in, in the officer's report. Um, so you get a feel for the general design of the properties, fairly traditional, a consistency to the design and, um, and the detailing. lots of different variations of very similar house types and they've got um, plans there of the garages in terms of their elevation and their, uh, their, their floor layouts. And then we've got photographs of the site. So this is the, um, the diagram showing where the photographs have been taken. And um, again, that's the full extent of the application site. So this is a photograph looking, oh, it's gone back a slide. This is a, a photograph looking into the development site from David Wilson's home site. You see there one of the mature trees close to the boundary that were retained as part of the development. We've then got a photograph looking towards Hilltop, which is the existing farmhouse and um, the range of associated farm buildings that have subsequently or in recent years been converted to residential properties. Again, you can see um, the, the mature protected trees close to the boundary and the protect the, the fencing that's um, that's been erected to, to protect those trees in respect to the David Wilson Homes development. Again, there's a picture of the a photograph of the mature trees on that particular boundary. These are four replacement trees on site, which are protected by TPOs. Now these trees are to be um, replaced and to be felled um, as a result of the development, but supplementary planting is proposed in compensation for the loss of those trees. These trees are in the main body of the site, but they're relatively young trees and there were replacement trees um, on the site. So we're comfortable that their um, removal and their replacement with um, significant number of other trees on the site is, is acceptable in this, this particular case. So we've got a photograph then of the, um, the wooded boundary with the A52 to give you the extent of the, the overall um, coverage of vegetation on that boundary. And then we've got the, um, the, the same view, just looking along the full extent of that up to the, um, up to the, 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 
the frontage to the site um, with Derby Road, which gives you an appreciation really for how well enclosed this site is currently from, from that, that vantage point. And it's very important we retain a strong um, vegetated and tree-lined frontage to the site to help filter views of this development and not result in an overly prominent development and retain important um, landscape, landscape features. So we've got then a view um, looking out towards um, the David Wilson's home site, which just shows the compound area. Um, you can see in the background there, you've got um, the, the farm buildings, the converted farm buildings associated with Hilltop. And then we've got a, a view along a distance view, which shows the full extent of this, this grassed area. Um, again, with the, the farm buildings shown in the background there. Happy to take questions at this point. I think before I do, it'd just be worth coming back on the, the points made by the first speaker about um, the access arrangements and pedestrian connectivity to the town and, and the implications of providing a pedestrian crossing point across this part of Derby Road. I think it's worth pointing out, as mentioned by the, the, pre, the, the applicants, um, applicants agents on the application that access was um, a matter that was dealt with at outline stage. And there was a specific condition, condition seven of the outline permission, which you haven't got before you, but what that condition required was that as part of um, any reserve matters application, the following shall be submitted to an approved in writing. And that includes the provision of a, a, front, a frontage footway from the new site along um, side Derby Road in the northwesterly direction to include safe crossing facilities for pedestrians. And the detail that's submitted as part of that must be presented to um, the local highway authority under a section 278 agreement. So the highway authority in, in, in agreeing the improvements to, to the highway, which will include the pedestrian footways and the associated infrastructure to accommodate pedestrians, will be a matter to be agreed with the local highway authority as part of that outline planning permission. So as part of that process, that the best options and the most suitable options for providing a pedestrian crossing point will be considered and dealt with by the local highway authority. And it will also, will also have um, the details presented to us in respect of that particular condition. And I think it, before I just take questions, what I'll do is just, um, revisit the spare me two minutes the highway comments on the original outline permission um, because i think they're quite useful what what the highway authority said is it's noted in respect of that original outline application that crossing opportunity is indicated on the new access um, proposals for pedestrians to cross derby road and there was recognition that whilst accepting that that was acceptable in principle that pedestrians crossing that section of road which is subject to relatively high passing vehicle speeds will require a greater level of visibility to approaching traffic to be provided and in order to safely cross the road so that has been thought through and considered by the local highway authority and as part of recommending that condition to us it was to make sure we agree the details as part of the the the, um, the outline permission the conditions that were were proposed were, were recommended but also to um, take a belt belt and braces approach again to make sure that that's all thought through and considered as part of that separate section 278 process. So happy, happy to take questions at this stage. Thank you very much, Chris. Yep, um, the first on my list is Councillor Burfoot. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, can I say thank you to John for giving uh, written responses to my questions that I put in earlier. So thank you for that. Um, this tactile crossing, um, could somebody explain to me and to the rest of the uh, members of the plan committee what exactly is meant by tactile crossing? That's the first question. Um, the second question is, did we actually ask for a link between this development and uh, through the um, the fields uh, between this site and David Wilson homes to actually to get to the school basically um, 
because otherwise that you know they're having to walk on this road so that, did we ask for that and then um the third question is about um noise attenuation for people who move into these houses um are we relying on on um tree screen or is there anything else that is possible um i don't particularly like the look of a t of noise attenuation screens um, but I did, I did notice in the previous, um, when we looked at it before, that that was something that the environmental health officer seemed to suggest was a possibility. Had we considered that? Thank you, Councillor Burke. We're just taking those questions in turn. So you have to forgive me, I'm not an expert um, in tactile uh, crossings, but I, my understanding is that a tactile crossing is a crossing where you know, you have the paving or the surface treatment changes. So I don't know if you've, you've come across a crossing where there's like knobbly bits to the paving slab. So you recognise that it's a um, a crossing point and there's obviously depression in the footway at that point as well. So that that's my understanding of what, what's meant by tactile um, crossing point. The actual uh, method of, of, of crossing and the nature of um, that crossing in terms of whether it'll have a refuge area is, and that is something that will need to be thought through and, and considered by the local highway authority in terms of its acceptability. So I'm hoping that, that gives you some comfort in terms of what I understand to be a tactile crossing to, to be. Yeah, um, thank you. The link, what, I'll just share my the presentation again. Um, there's a couple of issues with providing the link. Obviously, um, there's land ownership issues to be considered and, and rights of access and everything else. But if I just show you just bear with me two, two moments. Okay, so I should be sharing my screen which shows the layout of this development. So it is it is a fairly large site. I mean, we, we are, um, the, the developer is very close to achieving the, the maximum numbers of, of um, homes that we're approved its outline and you can see on this particular plan that you've got um, a gap here and if you look back or if we go further forward um, you can see the link through to the David Wilson Homes development there is an informal link here um, but what we've end, what we've got is um, dwellings that um, existing dwellings with private gardens that back onto the development site so there's very limited opportunity to provide an access or a pedestrian access through um, into this this um, consent previously consented development, so I think there is an opportunity. I mean, you can see here at the bottom end of the site there might be an informal route created, you know, through the public acts, public open space serving this development at the southern end of the site. Um, but it would be an informal route; it wouldn't be a, a, um, a made or an adopted route through the development site. So we did consider it. There was very limited scope in terms of what's been allowed in respect of the David Wilson Homes development and the opportunity to provide a formal link through the site. I think over time that may be an informal route, but the Highway Authority is satisfied that a crossing and pedestrian footway can be achieved along the site frontage to provide a safe means of pedestrian access in, into the town. Um, so it wouldn't form a sufficient reason to, to refuse the application in terms of lack of connectivity to the to the town and, and provision of safe means of, of pedestrian crossing points. So I hope, I hope that just answers your second question. The third question, noise attenuation. You're right that there is a schema for noise attenuation that was delivered in respect to the David Wilson home site. And the same applies to this site because there is the potential from noise from the A52. But we've got quite a significant um, wooded area to the south of the development site, an opportunity to introduce acoustic fencing and mitigation measures that can be successfully incorporated into the development without becoming obtrusive or harmful in, in, in landscape terms. So there is opportunities. It, it raises similar issues to the, the issues that were raised on that David Wilson's home site, but it is a consistent approach towards noise attenuation along that whole, whole boundary. Thank you, Chris. I would like to speak later in the debate. Okay, no problem, Councillor Burford. Councillor Slack. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, there's some good aspects uh, on this site. The, the affordable housing is uh, very good. It's uh, what uh, 
one thing which has not even been mentioned, which is the, probably the most <coughs> serious thing we, we look at today in our lives, is, is renewable energy and uh, the need for more renewable energy. And uh, there's not been a mention at all about deep boreholes by uh, solar panels uh, or, or uh, any other source of renewable heating. Um, I do, do hope not they're going to put gas boilers in all these houses, so I'll be very disappointed if they do, because we've got to start moving away from gas now. Electric boilers, yes, because we're renewing more electricity from electric, and we should keep going that, and we should encourage that all the time. So that's one of my questions. The officers, have they really encouraged to, to bring in uh, renewable energies or electric boilers instead of gas. And uh, my other part of the question is relating again to Councillor Burfoot. Um, you speak about this road being very speedy, a very fast road. Well, that's simple reason. Put some speed limits on it. Get it. Get the speed down. Get traffic calming in. Get the speed right down in. And then we can put uh, a crossing for pedestrians. Uh, Mr Jobs is right. Pedestrians have been ignored and children and families. I mean, we've got to use, we've got that used to using cars. We've got to start using his feet again. And uh, I think we should look at uh, doing more speed calming, but I know it's a county council issue, that one, but uh, we, we can uh, encourage the county to, to put a speed limit on it. But uh, I would ask the officers that uh, to bring your renewable energy into this site, to not have all gas boilers everywhere and. I mean, we've got to get away from gas. There's no two ways about it. So thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Slack. Just coming back on, on the uh, micro-generation or the renewable um, renewable equipment comment that you made, we do, on all developments, ask developers to have regard to policy PD7 of our local plan and to set out to us um, what they intend to do to help mitigate the effects of of global warming and adapt to climate change and the applicant in this particular case has set out the measures that they will um, incorporate into their houses at paragraph 7.28 of the officer's report and we've sort of considered that at 7.29 um, I think we need to reflect on um, when this permission was granted at outline stage it was pre um, pre-policy PD7 of the current local plan doesn't mean we can't um, encourage micro-generation as part of new developments and we do it consistently across the board particularly with all major developments but we have to weigh micro-generation against another other factors we have to accept that outline permission has been granted there's no conditions as part of that outline consent to require the developer to um, introduce micro-generation measures as part of this particular development and we have to weigh in other economic and environmental factors when coming to a decision on whether we should support development and when you weigh all that in the balance and when you reflect on when this permission was granted outline consent we feel that the measures that have been incorporated into this development are acceptable they're not necessarily the best measures in terms of addressing or mitigating the carbon footprint or the effects of um climate change but they go some way to helping um, to address that and we think it, they've gone far enough to be able to satisfy us that this development is acceptable in in, in accordance with development plan policies uh, can i just come back uh, chris um, yes, you can, yeah, yes. I, yeah i do take on board that uh, this uh, permission was quite a while ago now and uh, things have moved on but that doesn't stop this company now looking at the situation we're in in climate global warming and climate change. I think we better we better uh, put uh, uh, electric uh, boilers instead of gas in because it's an uh, advantage to the to the world. So you know they've got to take responsibility. Firms have as well as the uh, officers. I know the officers advise them and 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 try and guide them that way. But if they don't we will have to be stronger in the future on this really i do really so i do hope the, the company now look at this again and, and think that we're going to do as best we can for uh, against for climate change so thank you chair thank you very much councillor councillor purdy 
Thank you, Chair. I've got a couple of questions, um, but just to pick up Councillor Slack's point, uh, I mean, gas boilers are going to be phased out 2025, but talking to my heating engineer, he's got a great concern that the electric heating is only 50% efficient. So we've got a big debate there. Um, I've got a problem with the design. It's pretty boring. It's pretty standard, atypical design throughout the country. Um, fairly happy with the housing mix, but the transport um, assessment, I think I need to answer Councillor Dobbs if I may. Um, it is the Highway Authority, Mr Dobbs, that's responsible for this, but in a plan application, uh, officers can call for a, a transport assessment. So I think there's more work needed to be done there. Um, whilst it was approved in 2017, Chris, it wasn't in the local plan. Um, could you just expand on that a bit more, please, where this came from? Uh, and does this, if approved, affect our five-year housing supply? I think, it, yes, when this, when this application came forward, it was at a point in time where we couldn't demonstrate a five-year housing land supply. So it was a windfall development, some degree, on the edge of a, um, a main market town in our district. And way, you'll recall that we went through a phase, didn't we, of applying the tilted balance in respect of developments in terms of whether we can support them in accordance with national planning policy framework guidance because we couldn't demonstrate a five-year housing land supply and therefore the local plan or development plan was considered to be um, out of date. So we, we, um, we did apply that tilted balance and we considered this development site to be um, acceptable. So it did come forward um, at that point in time and ahead of adoption of the, the adopted local plan. Um, so I hope that answers the first, the first question there. And yeah, uh, thank you. It explains the circumstances surrounding this, this development. Mm -hmm. Thanks, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Archer. Thank you, Chair. Um, I fear that some of the questions I've got, some have already been answered, um, and so I, must, I suspect some more cases for highways, and, and as it's a, a reserve matters thing, we, it may, may be too late, but I want to ask a couple of things anyway, really. Um, first of all, in terms of the, the tactile crossing and the footway at the front of the site, the, a question about this, this footway at the front of the site that's been referenced. So am I correct in understanding that the intention is to actually build a new pavement um, on the same side of the road as the development that will run all the way down to the uh, the junction that goes off down to, um, to around Preston's garage to try and, and uh, mean that people do not have to cross the road. Um, because looking at the site, and for what I know the site, I think it will be, I'm struggling to see how they could build such a pavement all, all the way, or is it just getting me a little stretch of pavement to get us to this tactile crossing? Um, I was going to have the same question about the tactile crossing as, as a councillor Burfoot. Um, obviously, we don't know much detail about that, but just sticking one tactile crossing on that road is, would be lethal. And obviously, we need to know much more about, about traffic calming measures uh, that I think it was Councillor Slack mentioned. So what I know they're out of our control, and it's more to do with the county, but interesting that Councillor Purdy mentioned that we, we can um, ask for a transport assessment. I think that's, that's crucial. Whatever we can do as a, as a district council to try and mitigate potential issues with pedestrian safety, we need to do, because um, I completely agree with Mr. Dobbs on this. Look, I know this site really well. It's a really fast road. We've got hundreds of houses being built on the airfield. There's going to be a lot more traffic. We've had hundreds of houses built already in this area at the top of the hill. That the, the traffic is already very busy. We're going to have congestion. If you have traffic calming measures and crossings, that will increase the congestion. It's also going to increase the risk to pedestrians. So, so um I think I've rambled a bit, but there are a couple of questions in there. So what can we do to really try and force, ensure that we've got decent traffic calming, traffic calming measures? And what do we know about the detail of this proposed footway at the front of the site? Um, are my two main questions there, I think. Thank you. So my understanding of the, um, the crossing um, is it was indicated on the outline planning permission. And the intention is... Um, in order to comply with condition seven of the outline permission is for the crossing to be um, provided from the new site access along Derby Road in a north westerly direction. So if you look at, I'm assuming I'm sharing, I'm sharing the, the site layout plan here. So if you look at where the main access into the site is, the footway would run in a north westerly direction towards the town, if that makes sense. And then a tactile crossing um, point somewhere between that, that section of pavement on the other side of, of Derby Road. That's all to be agreed 
um, and finalise with the local highway authority, and they will advise on um, the appropriateness of any crossing in terms of its position and the nature of that crossing. And tactile, a tactile crossing point, I mean, it, I'm assuming that it's tactile paving to, um, to let you know where a dedicated crossing point is, but we haven't got the final details of what that will involve, but it, it does involve obviously a level of assessment from the professionals and the experts in that area, and that would be the local highway authority. Thank, thanks for that, Chris. I just, I do have major concerns because it means they're going to have, as Mr. Dobbs said, they're going to have to cross once there near the access point and then walk down the road and then cross again back over to, to catch buses and things down into town or to go to the Hilltop School. So they are going to be crossing that road twice, as Mr. Dobbs thought would be the case. And that, and that, that's, that's not a good outcome. I don't know I don't know if we can do anything about it at this point. I think we perhaps can't, um, but I just, I have got major concerns about that. So, so look, thanks for, thanks for your explanation. Thank you very much. Councillor Ball. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, well, I, like all the others, have got issues about the, obviously, pedestrian access and vehicular access for start off. Um, as we've all said, there's been lots of development. You've already showed them the Dave Wilson homes behind. Um, they had to extend the stay um, at um, where Preston's garage is uh, to sort that out. You know, um, the, the idea of putting a footpath, uh, and this was done, and I know we're on a reserve matter situation, but I would really like to think that before we ever said yay or nay um, to, I know we've got the outline, but I really do think this kind of access and pedestrianisation is sorted well before this is happening because we've got a similar situation in another village where it was promised that the footpaths were being put in and they're nowhere near. And I'm just very, very concerned that this will end up being the same situation. Um, uh, and, and, you know, I don't really see where it's feasible to put the crossing in. But other than that, actual vehicles turning out of that area, if it isn't being made any different to what it is at the moment, it is, it is a death trap and a, an accident waiting to happen. And I just want to make sure that before anything gets built on there, irrespective if we say, yes, they're good, we put your trees, you do everything else, something is going to be done with that access point and pedestrian points. That's what I need to be confirmed about, please. Thank you very much, Councillor Ball. Next on my list is Councillor Bottle. Oh, thank you, Jason. Um, there was one thing which I was curious about, which was which ones of these houses are they planning to be affordable and are they all the smallest ones? Or are we getting a range of sizes on the affordable choices? That was my first question. Uh, my second question was, um, well, it was about future proofing. Um, whether or not we can ask that they have a large enough airing cupboard to put in um, a hot water tank so they can use uh, um, air source heat pumps and can we ask them to have a large enough electrical control box so they can connect the solar panels to it because it's all very well pointing your house at the sun but it's no good if you have to knock down your garage to actually fit the, fit the electrics so I was wondering if those are things we could ask about. Thank you, Councillor Bottle. I think without the express consent of the um, the applicant to agree to a condition, I think um, I'd be cautious about imposing conditions to secure that. But I think we could um, certainly include an advisory footnote to um, to include those those measures that you've suggested. And I think the the applicant's agents here and she can take away those comments and feed them back to the developer and hope that they in incorporate those those measures into the the design of the the dwellings that are proposed um, as part of this application. Um, going back to your first question, the proposal is to deliver eight two-bed, four-person dwellings. So it is the um, the two-bedroom property types that will be delivered as affordable housing on, on the site. And that equates to a little over 22% of the um, total number of houses to be delivered on this site. So that means that we're delivering um, 
an offsite financial contribution for the remaining um, 22.8%, um, up to 45% of total provision. We have a tendency, I believe, to build two bedroom houses ourselves. Can we not take advantage of one of their three bedroom houses while we're at it, or is it too late? Well, we seek the advice of the head of housing, and the head of housing will indicate to us what the demand is. Um, based on what they know from home options data and the people that express an interest to them in terms of what they need. And that's indicated that the need on this particular site is for um, that number of two bed, four person units. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. The next on my list is Councillor Donnelly. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, I'm, I'm, I certainly can go with Councillor Archer and my two colleagues from Ashbourne, um, when the outline planning permission was granted, I was not happy with the access even onto Derby Road because it's right on top of an island uh, on the, as you come to north into Ashbourne. The actual, where we talked about, where Chris showed the, the um, pavement, or could, could be pavement, going towards Preston's garage on, on the left-hand side, obviously, you can't have a continuous payment there because you've got the toll bar cottage there. And there's no way you could you could actually put a um, a continuous payment in there. Now, if you actually do, if we can probably show that on the yeah. If you go along there towards towards Ashbourne, right there, that's it. Yeah. So you're right on top of the junction there, but the toll bar cottage sticks out, and until you and unless you narrow the road inwards then you would never get a payment there in the first place. Equally, if you do put a crossing up at this end here, and then you cross the road again, you would have put a crossing right on the junction of, of the old hill, Spittle Hill. So I don't see how it's going to work at all, really. But I mean, as I said, at the time, I didn't actually uh, um, agree with the access at the time, as it were, but the more I look at it now, and the more I hear people talking about um, the children going down the road to Hilltop and that. I think we're in a very precarious position, really. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Dolly. Councillor Lees. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Dolly's just brought up my concerns that uh, I was going to raise regarding the uh, Tollgate Cottage. You know, there's no pavement there, basically. And uh, again, just what Councillor Donnelly said, you know, all the councillors said from Ashbourne. It's it's impossible to cross that road back again towards a garage. It's, it's, it's people parking on the side of the road, going to the shops, garage. And I can't see how it's feasible to, for for safety reasons. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Lees. Before we move on uh, into debate, I just need a motion to extend the meeting beyond two and a half hours. So I'll move it. Can somebody second that for me, please, Councillor Donnelly? Second, sir. Yeah. Uh, all those in favour, please show. Thank you very much. So that extension has been granted. So now we've moved into debate. Councillor Burfoot. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, can I can I say the, the good points, if you like, um, in that, you know, the housing mix seems uh, good. We have got affordable housing on site and this developer hasn't tried to uh, to go down the road if it's not viable to do it on this particular site. So that's good. Um, I'm afraid there it kind of stops really because um, like somebody else said, um, they are pretty bog standard houses these. They don't seem to be uh, particularly innovative design, but that seems to be the way that uh, things are at the moment, that th those houses could be anywhere. Um, but I do have, as other members have said in, uh, in their questions and hinted at, um, there's a massive problem here with pedestrian safety. And, and we talk about um, sustainability and we talk about... Um, the needs of pedestrians, but no pedestrian, especially parents taking the children to school, are going to walk along that road. What are they going to do? They're going to get into the cars. And I don't blame them for that. 
but that's not what I call being a sustainable site. Now, um, when the committee looked at this in 2017, it said, and I'm quoting, the provision of a safe crossing facility for pedestrians should be included. Um, I realise what a tactile crossing is. A tactile crossing doesn't stop you getting knocked over by cars and lorries that are speeding down this road. Um, that is not going to solve the problem. Um, I mean, I think, I think what we should have asked for is a proper crossing with lights. Um, the average price of that is about £30,000. And what we never do, and I don't know whose fault, I'm not, I'm not laying fault on anybody, but I don't know whose fault it is, but we never do ask for this. We never ask. I can mention places in my clock where I live. We don't ask developers to stump up the money to make things safe. Um, the other thing I would say is that, you know, in this day and age, and again, I'm not picking out this developer, but um, all new properties should have solar panels on them. For the, for, you know, if they're buying in bulk, they can't be that expensive and put that much on the price of the house. And uh, my, the bee in my bonnet as well is that I do think all new developments should have sprinklers. Um, but going on to the onto this link, I think this is absolutely crucial that we that we get this link, um, so that you know people do have the opportunity to walk to to the school. Um, if, if we are talking about sustainability and looking after pedestrians then these are the sort of things that we, we we've got to do and i don't think we are doing here thank you thank you very much councillor burford councillor archer thank you chair my internet is coming up it's saying it's unstable so i'm sorry if i cut out on you and I'll, I'll, if i lose you i'll come back in a minute um I think I might have lost you because you were all frozen on my screen. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you. Loud and clear. Yeah, I, okay, can, hear right. you. I can hear you, Robert. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I lost you completely then. I think I can hear people coming back to me now. I don't know whether you can hear me or not. I'll I'll try and speak. Um, really, I was going to say a lot of what Councillor Burford thought, so, thought said, really. My concern is I would like my because of all the concerns to do with pedestrians. Council Archer suggests Safety, switch. I don't know where we stand Archer. in terms of um, whether we really can um, because of the things seem to be more to do with highways. Can't hear. Sorry. Chair, can you suggest that Council Archer switches his video off and he might get better reception? I have just, I have, I have just switched the video off. Yeah, can you hear has. me now? We can hear you now. Yes. Yeah, okay, I'll try again. Sorry, I can't see it. It keeps coming up as unstable internet. My apologies. Uh, yeah, I was really going to say a lot of what Councillor Burford said. Um, <clears throat> but my concern is I, I want to vote against this, really, because of the pedestrian um, issues and the, and the concerns raised there and the safety issues. And my, my instinct is very much to go against it. But as it's a reserve matters thing in terms of planning law and so on, I'm just not, not sure where we stand on that. So, so um, although I'm against it because of pedestrian safety, and, and it's perhaps too late to ask a question in, ter in terms of the practicalities of this, um, is that a legitimate reason for us to vote against it at this stage? or not because if it is I would very much like to vote against it until we've got far more assurances on pedestrian safety thank you thank you Councillor O'Brien yeah thank you Chair um, I would actually following on from uh, Councillor Archer's uh, point there I would, I would like to move that the application is uh, deferred for further negotiations with, with the applicant and uh, three three principal reasons for that. Um, firstly, the, the housing mix issue, I, I'd say I, I don't agree with colleagues on this. Um, we have a very clear policy which says, um, which is in the corporate plan and picked up by the peer review that we need to uh, uh, think again about our approach to the housing mix, uh, including for the market housing element 
Um, here we had um, um, a requirement in the original um, outline approval for 40% uh, um, uh, smaller units in the market housing. We're now being asked to approve uh, an application which has gone down to 25% uh, um, smaller units. Now, I don't, I don't think that's, a, that, that's a, a, a reasonable justification. I don't think the provision of affordable housing is itself a reason for uh, moving away from our policy on uh, a mix of, of uh, market housing. They're, they're two separate things. And it's no wonder that we reported in the an annual monitoring report that we'd never achieved our uh, policy HC11 on housing mix if, 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 this, is, if this is how we approach it. That, that's, that's one issue. On, the, on the, the transport issue, I entirely agree but it, it is our responsibility as a district council to approve developments which are, which are safe and well designed. And I don't think it's satisfactory just to say, oh, well, we'll leave that to be sorted out by the county council at a later stage. This is so crucial to uh, the well being of, of future residents of Ashbourne. It's something that needs to be uh, negotiated and agreed uh, before we, uh, as a district council, are prepared to give. Uh, permission for this development. Um, the, the third issue is on on the design, and here I, I absolutely agree with um, Councillor Purdy. Here um, we, we've got a development which consists of houses, roads, uh, trees, uh, some open space. What we don't have is is something which is going to create a place. We've just got a mixture of, of different elements. Um, just to sort of elaborate that on a little, a little bit, where the affordable housing is down in the southeast corner, uh, the aspect of those houses is purely uh, a parking area, which is, which, which is an appalling uh, setup. Um, we've got landscaping, uh, good landscaping um, flows through a development. Uh, it isn't just um, it isn't just pieces of leftover space. Uh, there's no way that this landscaping flows through, and so uh, as an ecosystem, it, it, it really fails. We, we've got a road, um, a highway with uh, two footways, where we could have a, uh, a shared space, uh, which becomes a place for everyone instead of being car-dominated. Um, if you look at the core, the, the first uh, internal corner of the development there, you, you have two dwellings, one is a Crompton and one is a, another style. You could touch one house from the other house and the, the design of that, that corner there is, is I, I can't really believe that they've come forward with that design. And that's something that people in the future would look at and say, who on earth allowed that to, um, to, to, to come forward? And then, as others have said, we have the, the accessibility, internal accessibility and permeability for pedestrians, which is, which is non-existent. So as, you know, as um, Sue Burford, as others have said, people are just going to jump in their cars. So I think there's a whole range of reasons, three reasons I would put forward, where uh, we need to uh, mandate our officers to say, look, this is not a satisfactory development for a variety of reasons. And, and uh, yes, you've tried hard, but uh, you need to try harder. So, so please go back and renegotiate and come back to us with a scheme which we can all be, all be happy with. So I, I would move that this is deferred for further consideration. I'll second that, John or Chris, do you want to come back on that point? Um, could I come back on a number of those points? Um, I think in seeking deferment, we should focus on the matters that require our consideration in respect to this current application. Just going back to what the reserve matters are, in terms of access, it's only insofar as the internal the state roads serving this development. So the access, the main access into the site, the quantum of development, the amount of development that's been allowed has been agreed at outline and the provisions, provision for pedestrian safety is being considered as part of that application. So I think to defer the item or defer this particular application for that reason would go beyond the scope of, of this particular permission um, because there are measures in place, there are conditions to, in, to um, incorporate 
um, a, a suitable facilities to serve this development to the satisfaction of the local highway authority. So I think we're going beyond, for, for that particular reason, I think we're going beyond the assessment and scope of this particular application. Um, going back to the housing mix, um, I think just to clarify that the 40% provision of one bed properties is in relation to affordable dwellings on site. Um, it's 5% of market, but you have to have a blend. There's a blended figure of 15% of smaller units, one bedroom units. We have to reflect on the, um, the amount of developments proposed here. We're dealing with a development of 36 dwellings. It's impossible to achieve um, those percentages exactly. But in terms of what is being delivered, um, we've got two one bedroom properties, which equates to 6% provision. Um, two bed, 12 two bed, which is 33% provision. And the requirement is for a blended figure of 40. Um, for three bed properties, we've got 18, which is 50% provision. And we're given a blended figure of 40. And for four bed, we've got a, a figure of 11% of the overall number of units. The blended figure is 5%. So we're very close to that mix. But I think what you've got to also factor in is that we're delivering um, an off-site financial co contribution towards affordable housing. So there's a contribution towards the delivery of affordable housing elsewhere, which will be more than likely spent on the, um, the delivery of smaller affordable dwellings. So I think factoring that in, the, the amount of development that's proposed as part of this application and the actual... Um, the actual mix that's proposed as part of this development. I think it's very close to that housing mix. And I think it's an acceptable mix um, that is that is proposed and that's been carefully thought and, and thought about and justified by the developer. So I think if members were minded to defer, I think they need to expressly state the reasons because that there is that level of assessment as to why this mix is considered appropriate as part of this application. Thank you very much, Chris. So can I just can I come uh, back on that chair for a moment? I, I, I'm not, I wouldn't die in the ditch over the, the housing mix, but I'd, I would say to John that the, the, the mix is related to the market housing and you're adding in the affordable housing in order to justify uh, to justify your point there. Um, but, but I do think it's the design that is really that for me is the um, if for me is the issue and I think if we if we negotiate on the if you like the internal design to make it a place a safe place and I should have added in in fact that we've got a we've got a play area which is stuck behind a fence it's totally it's totally not overlooked it's probably the most unsafe play area I can, I've ever seen on the development which will be another reason for for, for, for not going ahead with it. I think if, if we start renegotiating on the in, internal layout, if you like, and that gives us an opportunity to to have a discussion with the county council to say, look, we need to sort out the the, the, the external safety issues at the same time and, uh, and not just sort of abrogate responsibility for that. Can I say something, yeah, at this, this Of course point? you can, John, carry on. Yeah. Um, I've heard what members have said about pedestrian safety and I, and I can fully accept that this is not a perfect site in terms of pedestrian movements and desire lines. But I think Chris has given you sound advice in that the principle of, of um, putting in a crossing here to address that is something that's in the conditions on the outline permission. That would be reasonable, I guess, if you were going asking us to negotiate on other matters to try and get a bit more clarity on that particular issue in the meantime, and we could bring that back to you as part of the package to describe the uh, the scheme. But I don't think it's negotiable. I don't think we negotiate away Condition Seven and go for a different different solution. In terms of the uh, the housing mix, I, I th again I think you've been given sound advice by Chris. I think we need to take a a rounded view on this in terms of what the site delivers. The 45% of affordable housing is beyond what you could reasonably expect under your current plan policies. It just happened at that moment in time. That's, that's what the draft policy said. And I think you need to take that into account in terms of what that delivers both on and off site in terms of the housing mix. The design point, I've, I have to say, I've got got some sympathy with that um I've, I've seen more creative solutions in terms of uh, the built environment the dilemma i think we've got on that is just knowing exactly from members which component parts of it is we're being asked to negotiate on it's difficult if we get a deferral um if we've got a you know 
a less than clear message as to which elements we, we members are asking us to negotiate over. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Councillor Slack. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think we've, uh, on the affordable housing, I think, same as John said, 45%, it's very good now, really, to get 45%, and I, I am pleased with that side. The housing mix, uh, I've seen better housing mixes, I've seen worse housing mixes, uh, but um, well, we could improve on the housing mix if we negotiated with them. Also, uh, the design of the houses, yeah, they're not the best design, but I would sooner see a property like that with solar panels on, which is generating clean electricity for people than having a, a big posh house with no solar panels on. So, I mean, it, it's uh, horses for courses, really. <clears throat> and we've got to take on board that renewable energy is number one. It's not number two, it's number one. Design is not number one. Affordable energy is number one. And we've got to get round to that and, and as mindset on that. And we must move towards that. So uh, on the uh, highways, yeah, we, I think it will come about that uh, we will get across it eventually with the county council. It, it's, uh, it's open to negotiate. They will negotiate across it. But uh, there'll have to be traffic calming, very much so, because it is a very, very busy road there. So... Um, probably not tw plenty for 20, but uh, cutting right down to probably 30. They have to cut it down to 30 there at least. So, uh, yeah, I've, um, I don't think we're going to achieve a lot by deferral, really. Uh, in fact, we've got past that stage, unfortunately. But um, I would like to see more negotiations, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Slack. Councillor Buttle. Councillor Buttle. Sorry about that. Pressed the wrong button. I probably muted myself. Um, I've got two questions. The first is, can we use Section 106 money to upgrade a crossing from tactile to with little lights and what have you? Is that our money to spend on the on the on the services that we feel this requires? Because if we can do that, then that gives us the option to actually uh, step away from just blocking this whole thing and letting them get on with it. But in return, I'd really like something on uh, a bit of space for kids to play out on, which isn't next to a road with poor air quality, possibly some space for people to grow something, because I believe one in 20 houses are supposed to have an allotment or something, something like that. There's some large number of allotments that are supposed to go with a, with a development. So there we go. That's, that's my bit of debate. I'm not sure quite who's going to answer it now. John, Chris, do you want to come back on that? Yeah, could I come back on the legal agreement aspect? Um, just to clarify, yeah. Councillor Buttle, that the Section 278 agreement with the local highway authority is a separate legal agreement with them. And... Um, the agreement is to make permanent alterations to, or improvements to a public highway as part of a planning approval. So that would include um, a suitable crossing point. It could ultimately be a traffic light controlled crossing point that's delivered. And that would have to be um, an agreement with the developer and the highway authority if they considered that to be appropriate, as would the extent of any footway um, along the A52. Again, that's something to be agreed as part of that process with the um, with the local highway authority, it's not it's not something to we can't revisit the terms of the original section 106, which sought developer contributions um, linked to um, development plan policies and requirements. That is separate to that and specific to highway um, improvement works. Does that yeah, make thank sense? you very much, Chris. I'm, I'm sorry, that just leaves me with a question about the children's area alongside a road. Yeah, the. Just to provide some clarity on that. So you've got um, a little bit of a woodland belt. I mean, I can go back to the previous, let's go back to the previous slides. Shows it better on the, on the layout here. So you've got this informal sort of area of, of public open space here. It's relatively modest, I accept that. You've got um, a, then a tree 
a tree belt along the southern boundary with the A52. I mean, there's a bit of an embankment there. Um, you are going to have noise, but um, and and and, and um, issues perhaps with air quality. Um, but it is in a, a wooded area, and the pr proposal is to introduce um, informal play within that wooded space, and then there's a more open area of public open space at the southern corner of the site. I think it's a difficult site because two sides of the site are enclosed, aren't they, by roads, quite busy roads. Um, there's very little opportunity really to achieve public open space on this site that, that isn't affected to some degree by, by air quality. And I think on balance and reflecting on the amount of open space to be delivered to survey development of this size, it is considered to be acceptable provision. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Councillor Morley. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's an interesting debate and some very valid points. I would just like to remind colleagues and draw attention to an email that John sent out earlier in the week asking for us to clarify any serious issues before we got to this point. And something as fundamental as redesigning, rebuilding a children's playground is I think beyond the remit of where we are and should have been sorted out before. So I would not be supporting a deferral. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Morley. Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Chair. Well, I'll try to be brief because it's getting lengthened out. Um, I can't support a deferral, although I have great sympathy with that consideration. Um, if you look at the two rows of designs, it's the top row, Chris, that irks me. Um, but I think that if you look at the developments throughout the country, um, there are obviously these architects, I think they fetch them off a the shelf, quite frankly, um, and regurgitate them. I think Chris has answered quite succinctly that it wouldn't be prudent to do a federal and uh, about a Chris's uh, knowledge on that, in that I think we have the housing mix as, as near as we can get it. Uh, and it is pretty good in the scheme of things. Um, play area, yes, I've seen better, I've seen worse, so I'm not going to lose sleep over that one. I think that the highway safety factor um, can be pressured by local ward members, uh, both district and county, in following this up. Uh, and I would appeal to them to do that, to call a site meeting and put pressure on the highways to follow up recommendation seven and see what you can get best out of it. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Purdy. Councillor Fitzherbert. Uh, thank you. Well, I've, I've listened with interest um, to the debate here and all the questions here. And um, I, th I think Chris mentioned that there was a sort of slip road walk through to the David Wilson development next door, which, which may be a, a better route anyway, and the more logical route, uh, a nicer route to take to, to Hilltop, which may be the thing. And I, I really don't think that, um, you know, deferment is really going to, to help us in this. When, when if you look in... Uh, 7.8 a number of on page 58 a number of significant changes have been made to the scheme including the reconfiguration of the layout etc now we may or may not uh it may not may or may not be to our particular liking and i have a lot of sympathy with a lot of the comments already made previously but i, I really think that the uh, developers will um have listened to this particular debate uh certainly you know they, they spoke earlier etc and I'm sure they'll have discussions with our officers afterwards. So I won't be supporting the deferment. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Fitzherbert. So I've got nobody else on my list. It's been moved and seconded for deferment. What I'd like to do is give Councillor Burfoot and Councillor O'Brien an opportunity to set out uh, in, in planning terms why they seem to think it needs to be deferred. So if, if you'd like to have a conversation with yourselves and try and put some bones on it. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll be able to move forward with it, but I think we, we just need that um, to be um, uh, teased out, actually, what your grounds are for deferment. Councillor O'Brien, Councillor Burfoot. Well, I, if, I, if I start off, I think the, 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 the principal ground is that uh, the, the um, uh, if you like, the, the design 
uh, um, a layout uh, the um, the roads uh, landscaping and other elements are not conducive to uh, um, the creation of a of, of a development which is um, uh, which is uh, safe um, sustainable uh, achieves pedestrian perme permeability. Uh, those are the sort of issues I think that um, we would request a deferment on. And in, in addition to the issue um, of, of the need to secure uh, uh, an inherently safe uh, means of uh, access and egress uh, from the site, not notwithstanding the, the, the issue around the uh, the nature of the reserve matters. Uh, I think there's a, a quite justifiable grounds for deferment, and I, I would suggest we would get a far better, uh, a far better result uh, as a result of a deferment, because as as, as others have said, that uh, the developer has been listening to the points made by the uh, by members this evening, um, and. Uh, for the, for the developer then to take them on board, I think requires a, a deferment, which gives them the opportunity to do that. Nothing to do yeah. Right, in which, John, do you, do you find that acceptable, Chris? Well, I, I think, I think, Chair, um, if it's the will of members that, that the item is deferred and we go back on those issues, we, we'll take your instruction on that and, and uh, Hopefully, there is a, an option for the developer to take on point, all those points and improve the scheme, and we can bring it back to you. Okay, thank you very much. So it's been moved and seconded for deferment, uh, as outlined by Councillor O'Brien and, and Councillor Burfoot. So we'll go to the vote, please, Simon. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Archer? For. Atkin? Against. Full. Abstention. Burfoot. Four. Buttle. Four. Donnelly. Against. Elliot. Against. Fitzherbert. Against. Lees. Against. Morley. Against. O'Brien. Or. Purdy. Against. And Slack. Abstain. Okay, Chair. So that's three, four. Um, that's four, four. Uh, Seven against and two abstentions. So that vote has been lost. So now what I'm looking for is a motion to approve subject to conditions. Move the recommendations, Chair. Members, it's over to you. Councillor Purd is moving the recommendations as set out in the report. I'd be quite under seconder. Yeah, I'm happy to second that, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Morley. So it's been moved and seconded for approval subject to conditions. Simon, can we go to the vote, please? OK, so thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Archer? Against. Atkin? Or Ball? Abstain. Burfoot. Against. Buttle. Abstain. Donnelly. Against. Elliot. Four. Fitzherbert. Four. Lees. Against. Morley. Four. O'Brien against Purdy or 
and Slack. Absolutely. Okay, so it's one, two. We've got five who are for, we've got one, two, three, four, five who are against, and three abstentions. So it's left to me to use my casting vote, and I'll vote four. Okay, Chair. So that has been passed. Thank you very much, members. Before we move on, what we'll do is we'll just have a little five minute come for a break. You could all come back at nine o'clock and we'll finish the rest of the uh, committee off. Thank you very much. So back at nine o'clock.
Thank you very much, members. Hopefully everybody's back in the room. Are we all back in? Uh, Chair, I believe uh, Councillor Graham Elliott and also Councillor Peter Slack have left the meeting, uh, as far as I can see. Okay, thank you very much. So anyway, it's just a little bit, so we'll start the meeting again. It's just a little bit of housekeeping now. Item number six, information on active and closed enforcement investigations. John, all members, anything you wanting to add? Nothing to add from me, Chair. No, so it's just for noting, so uh, I'll, I, I'll move them for noting. Second, please, Second. Councillor Donnelly. Second, Chair. All those in favour, please show. Thank you very much, members. And item number seven is appeals progress report. John. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. We've got a couple of uh, appeal reports uh, attached to the papers. Um, the, the first of those relate to um, unauthorised development at Alders Lane. A little bit frustrating that we've had uh, notices quashed. It does happen from time to time if there's a, a technical flaw on those. Um, that doesn't mean that the problem has gone away and we are actively seeking to resolve those enforcement complaints. So uh, no doubt you'll hear about them in due course. Um, good result, I think, on the uh, on Amy Croft Farm. Um, the, the site owner there has a limited period of time in which to move the unauthorised <coughs> office building. And just as a further update, the appeal uh, on the site at um, three to five Rodsley Lane, you may recall the provision of in Kirtledge parking on the frontage of properties within the village there of Newley. Um, the inspector has dismissed that appeal. So he's agreed with the decision of the local planning authority, which I think is a good decision because it shows that inspectors are keen to protect the character and appearances of our villages. So nothing further to add, Chair. Thank you very much, John. If nobody else has got anything to add to it, so it's just for noting. So I so move. Councillor Donnelly, second. Second chair. Second chair. Uh, just to show hands, all those in favour, please show. Thank you very much, members, and thank you very much. That's the end of the planning committee for March. So I will see you. Uh, next week at the full council meeting. So thank you very, very much to members, officers, and all those public participants. Thank you for the public. Good night. Good night.